Welcome to San Diego Integral, November 11th, 2023. Our topic today, Meta-Ideological Politics Beyond Polarization and Extremism, presented by Ryan Nakade. Uh, welcome to San Diego Integral, everyone. I'm Jerry Golick. I'm a member of San Diego Integral's leadership team. We have an exciting presentation today by Ryan Nakade and it's titled Meta-Ideological Politics Beyond Polarization and Extremism. Let's go ahead and uh, get the meeting started. And in order to, to introduce our uh, speaker, I'm going to turn the meeting over to, uh, to Karen. Uh, so go ahead, take it away, Karen. There, I'm unmuting myself. I am delighted to be presenting tonight's speaker, Ryan Nakati. Ryan was one of my very first Integral Buddies. We met online on the Integral Life Forum in 2018, shortly after I joined it, and we clicked. Ryan has a finger in a lot of interesting pies. He's introduced me to some of my favorite online communities, one of which led me to San Diego Integral by two degrees of separation. So tonight it feels like the completion of a circle to welcome Ryan here to give our presentation this evening. I have been watching the trajectory of Ryan's work as he trained and then worked as a professional mediator, and I continued watching with some concern as he began hanging out with members of extremist groups, infiltrating hate groups, and then building alliances between unlikely ideological bedfellows. At present, Ryan is the project manager for Cure PDX, a Department of Homeland Security funded project that's focused on countering political and extremist violence in the Pacific Northwest. Ryan facilitates workshops on conflict resilience, transformative dialogue, depolarization, ideological awareness, complex systems, and mis- or disinformation. And he does this for communities, governments, businesses, faith groups, journalists, elected officials, and civic organizations. In his spare time, Ryan focuses on building out his meta-ideological approach to depolarization and counter-extremism. This is what he will be sharing with us tonight, along with stories from his fieldwork. Ryan lives in Toledo, Washington, and also enjoys spending time with his wife and seven goats. And I have to say personally, Having Ryan's presentation tonight feels particularly timely with the alarming things that have been happening in the news cycle and the rapidly increasing polarization in the world today. And with that, I gladly turn this over. Welcome, Ryan, to San Diego Integral. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, and for inviting me and uh, connecting me to this group. And uh, wonderful to be here with all of you today. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm looking forward to meeting everyone uh, who I have not met. Um, and I'll just mention, too, I want to apologize in advance. Uh, I was telling Eloy this a few days ago that I'm currently dealing with an unknown um, neurological slash nervous system issue that prevents me from sleeping. Uh, so I've the last few months have been one or two hours of sleep a night. And uh, I was at a sleep clinic last night and apparently feel like a zombie right now. So I apologize for not being as lucid or as crisp or sharp as I normally am. Um, but I will try to spend both of this with all of you and we'll get through it together. So, um, right, I will share my slides, share my screen here. Okay, so um, we're gonna do a little, uh, I don't know, like maybe like 45 minute kind of high level uh, philosophical overview of the approach and some of the ways that I've been trying to apply it. And then we'll do breakout groups. And uh, I'd love to hear from all of you on what you think of it and how we can brainstorm together on applying some of these ideas. So just a little bit about myself, just to build a little bit on what Karen shared at the beginning. Um, my background is in mediation and conflict resolution. Actually, when I had met Karen, I, would, I had just finished my training. I was very excited sharing these insights with her. That was, uh, I think, four years ago. Yeah, about five years ago. And I became increasingly concerned about political polarization and extremist violence and wanted to do something about it. So started reaching out to people of different groups and talking to them. Um, and uh, as I said, I live in Toledo, Washington. The most important part about me is I have seven goats. So I'll show you some of them. This is Tiny, and this is Maybelline. Uh, this is Squeezy, that's my wife. And uh, this is Delilah Rose, we call her the angel. So these are my kids, literal literal kids, as they say. 
Uh, so a little bit my, my, about my work context and, and the avenue in which I'm, I've been applying some of these ideas. So I am the project uh, coordinator for Cure PDX, where a Homeland Security funded project focused on countering toxic polarization and violent extremism in, in the Pacific Northwest uh, from Portland up to Olympia, Washington. And we use what's called a public health approach to combat political violence using credible messengers. And these are individuals who have trusted relationships with their unique niches and circles. And then they then we then hire them, train them, and then they use their social capital and de-escalation skills to calm down any tensions that could escalate into violence on their side. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit about this later. Um, so that's kind of the the my day job, so to speak. And then we'll talk about how uh, I've been experimenting, playing around with some of these ideas in this in this field. So we're going to start off with a little poll. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is something that was done. This was a poll that was taken recently. And so people who support the Republican or Democratic Party and its ideologies have become so extreme. This is this is what people think of each other and what they want, that it is acceptable to use violence to stop them from achieving their goals. 41% of Biden supporters agreed and 38% of Trump supporters uh, also um, agreed. And then if we have another statistic here, the poll found that the shares of both Biden and Trump supporters are open to using undemocratic means to achieve the party's ideals. Uh, a significant share of response questions if democracy is no longer a viable system of governance. So 31% of Trump supporters said America should explore alternative forms of government to ensure stability and progress compared to 24% of Biden supporters. So you can see um, polarization, right? Um, the notion that we should try more extreme tactics. These are all, these have all been um, uh, wrapping up recently. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think we have another little Zoom issue going on. All right, so we're going to jump into exploring this idea of ideology, and then we'll eventually build to what is meta, and then what is meta ideological politics. So I want to hear from all of you. Type in the chat, what is your definition of ideology? I'll be tracking the chat, and then I will be um, reading out loud. All right, so Bart said, set of beliefs. Yes, great. Ideology values, yes, absolutely. Tenets, great. Yeah, these are great answers. Beliefs, values, same. Great. Mental framework in which you view an issue. Love it. See if there's any, any more. Study of ideas. Ooh, all right. Going for the original original definition or, or uh, literal definition. Action driver, guiding principles, a thought structure defines how I understand and react to events, an idea or philosophy that takes a place of examining rally. These are really brilliant. I have another slide where basically all of these are all on one slide. So love how you're, you're thinking about this, right? So we're, we're talking about a frame, a lens, patterns of beliefs, structures of thought, Right, all of all of uh, all of this. So, let's look at a few uh, um, technical definitions. This person, that let me actually restart my screen again to remove that. Um, all right. So, the dictionary.com definition, very simple, right? Is a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. Uh, the other, the other original definition is the science of ideas by Antoine Destute de Tracy, and he was an Enlightenment uh, thinker who was imprisoned during the reign of terror in France in 1796. And so, uh, idio, idea, ology, science of the science of ideas. Right. So I, I've done a lot of research and read about this issue, thought about this, and and I have my own definition. It's kind of the Ryan definition. Ideology is a system of contested abstractions about the socio-political world with normative implications and effects. So contested means that it's not only values and beliefs and ideas, but there's some polarization, disagreement, or uh, conflict energy around it. Right. So I, I have a different set of abstractions I'm using to understand the political world that inform what I'm for and what I'm against normatively. And you maybe if you have a different one, we're now at loggerheads ideologically or philosophically or on the level of ideas. So we'll be exploring that definition, which brings in this element of polarization and conflict into it. So this is just me nerding out a little bit about the etymological roots, right? So I did a little digging. Apparently, the, the Latin root of abstraction is abstrahere, I think you pronounce it, which means to draw away. So when you're abstracting, you're drawing away from the concrete 
detailed specific things and you distill information, you abstract it out. So you, you lose some detail, but then what you're left with is a more general or universal category concept or idea, right? A more enveloping umbrella term. You can see here the ladder of abstraction. You're moving up from specific, identifiable, concrete, detailed things into these abstract, more generalized universal categories. Right. So when we're thinking of ideology, we're thinking of abstractions. We're thinking of values, ideas, concepts, principles, categories, you know, all of these were listed in your definitions. Right. So a lot of what ideology involves are these deep philosophical assumptions and presuppositions that often tend to be unfalsifiable or impossible to validate empirically, meaning that we can't see some of these ideas under a microscope in the same way we can observe cells and bacteria and the stars and, and natural phenomena. So some example, what I call the raw materials of ideology, notions of rights, right? My second amendment, gun rights, your right to universal healthcare, different, different tensions around ideas of rights that could be reflective of ideology, right? Values, principles, and moral sentiments, right? What we think is right and wrong, right? Uh, people who are familiar with like Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations, I'd include that in this category. Interpretive frames, like judicial interpretive frames, right? Debates on how to interpret the U.S. Constitution. We have originalism and textualism on the more conservative side. We have pragmatism and evolutionism uh, on the more progressive side, right? Notions of causality and root causes. What is the underlying cause of social pathology? If you ask some traditional conservatives like Dennis Prager, he'll say it's secularism. If you ask uh, other fo libertarian oriented folks, it could be government intervention, right? If you ask uh, more progressive minded folks, it could be racism or discrimination. What are the root causes of different social pathologies and the causal dynamics? That's another kind of abstraction, right? How we classify and categorize, how we how we slice and dice up the world schematically. What are the groups that are that are that we can uh, label, right? Patriots, anti-racists, the top one percent, the woke left, the whatever, the this, the that, right? And so it's kind of like a codification or ideology can act as a kind of um, taxonomy for how we think about social reality, right? Notions of human nature, like blank slate versus original sin or innate goodness, right? This comes down to like John Locke and uh, Rousseau and right all of these different ideas of the nature of human beings and what systems would work for us, depending on how we conceive of what that nature is. And ide often ideology gives that, um, fills that uh, gap. Social ontology. So what is the fundamental unit of society? So Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. That would be a kind of a social ontological claim about what social structures actually exist, right? Other people would say there are collective structures that, you know, there's society, there's the nation, the nation state, right? What are the real things that exist in society? Often ideology informs that. And then hyper objects, if for anyone who's read the philosopher, Timothy Morton talks about hyper objects or objects are so big and vast, distributed across vast swaths of space and time that you can't see them or grasp them directly in the same way I can grasp, say, a water bottle. But they're still real things that exert some ontological gravity onto us. We're subsumed into these hyper objects, these macro structures, like the deep state, patriarchy, the globalist, capitalism, climate change, right? These are all things that we can't see directly. So ideology provides the abstractions for us to conceive of them. So this is uh, from uh, Michael Frieden is one of the foremost scholars on ideology and one of my favorites and uh, one of the thinkers that's most influenced my thinking. And this is a long quote, but I'm going to kind of stumble through it. Uh, and he said, and he he goes on these kind of poetic rants in his books, and he says he describes ideology as the fluid and mutating forms of ideas that fashion the shared identity and action patterns of human communities, the actual, the potential, and the possible, as well as ruling out those that are effectively unattainable. They are the ubiquitous modes through which we access, shape, acclaim, contest, and disavow all that pertains to the social and political space we occupy at all levels of articulation and sophistication, including those that are unconscious and unintentional. For anyone wishing to comprehend how societies think politically, ideologies are the language through which the visions of collective selfhood present themselves. Social goals are set, and the significance allotted to what happens or might happen in the societies that concern us is differentially distributed. They are the beating heart of the everyday expression and communication of those features. And this is the part that I found most, um, the most kind of stuck with me. All told, told, ideology is the crucial port of call through which we enter the world of political thought. The access route framing all the evidence we process and the inquiries we undertake. So even the questions we think to ask to pursue is dictated by some kind of presupposed abstraction or frame. And I think that's the thing that we're not aware of in this kind of climate of polarization. We're lost in the frame, not looking at the frame, as I'll describe in a minute. 
So when we're looking at ideology as a kind of framing apparatus, we're not talking about specific facts, data points, or policies, but the overarching frameworks or ideational context, context of ideas that drive what I call the selection, organization, interpretation, and implementation of various informational outputs like facts, data, experiences, narrative, arguments, memes, aesthetics. And then the ideology turns these, these inputs into normative goals, agendas, policy positions, et cetera, right? So if you have a very crude, this is a very, very crude linear input output model. Obviously the real life is much more complex than this diagram, but we have, as human beings, we have data, we have facts, we have empirical evidence, we have life experiences, right? We hear narratives in our community. Ideology is a framework that processes these inputs with the values, ideals, ideas, concepts, language, et cetera, and then out are spit different policy positions and goals and such that we're for, right? It's the selection of, of inputs and how they're organized, and then we interpret them and bring meaning to them, and then we act on them and implement them, right? That's the action part. So ideology is kind of framing apparatus. So we'll look at this a little bit more on this slide. Some of you might have heard of George Lakoff. Uh, he's a cognitive linguist who um, was really trying hard to get progressives and Democrats to do better with framing and messaging. And, and uh, what he says in this book is that he's just talking about frames and the importance of framing. And he says, frames are mental structures that shape the way we see the world. As a result, they shape the goals we seek, the plans we make, the way we act, and what counts as a good or bad outcome of our actions. In politics, our frames shape our social policies and the institutions we form to carry out policies. To change our frames is to change all of this. You can't see or hear frames. They are part of what cognitive scientists call the cognitive unconscious, structures in our brains that we cannot uh, consciously access, but know by their consequences, the way we reason and what counts as common sense. We also know frames through language. All words are defined relative to conceptual frames. When you hear a word, its frame or collection of frames is activated in your brain, right? So how we communicate with each other, the language, these all, all, all of these connote the kind of framing in the background. Now, this is one more long quote. I promise I'll stop quoting long things after this. This is so funny. I read this and I laughed to myself, okay? He says in the book, the question I asked myself was this, what do the conservatives' positions on issues, remember he's coming from a progressive left perspective, have to do with each other? If you are conservative, what does your position on abortion have to do with your position on taxation? What does that have to do with your position on environment or foreign policy? How do these positions fit together? What does being against gun control have to do with being for tort reform? What makes sense of the linkage? I could not figure it out. I said to myself, these, these are strange people. We talk about the conservatives. Their collections of positions make no sense. But then an embarrassing thought occurred to me. I have exactly the opposite position on every issue. What do my positions have to do with one another? And I could not figure that out either. That was extremely embarrassing for someone who does cognitive science and linguistics. So we can think of ideology as the invisible glue that holds seemingly disparate beliefs and positions together as a pattern. Somehow all of these things, which theoretically have nothing to do with each other, coalesce or, or, or come together in some kind of coherent pattern. We can call that ideology. More definitions of ideology, then we'll move on to meta. Archetypes of political thinking, I really like that one, kind of like a, like a union emphasis, right? Kind of a center of gravity that collates clusters or patterns of political thinking. Vectors or trajectories of political reasoning, right? It's a vector, it's a trajectory or direction that guides how you reason in one way or another, probabilistically more this way than that way, right? Depending on how, if you lean left, right, center, et cetera. Families of isms and species of beliefs, this would be like socialism, conservatism, libertarianism, liberalism, et cetera. These are some pejorative ones, right? Low resolution abstractions, that's from Jordan Peterson. So abstract frameworks that can't track the details of specific things that, so you're not specific enough in your analysis. Constellations of sacred values, right? Action oriented sets of beliefs. They're beliefs that cause us to act in a certain patterned way. Political dogma and fundamentalism, that's another kind of pejorative definition of ideology. Lack of pragmatism or critical thinking, right? Someone says, you're thinking ideologically and not being practical. You've heard that one before. And finally, this idea of immune to empirical revision, meaning that you're stuck in abstractions but not looking at facts and, and you know, kind of concrete empirical data that should inform your thinking. So here's the thing, facts are important, but, and, and this is my opinion, and people can contest this if you want to, but in my field in countering violent extremism, there's a lot of talk on misinformation, disinformation, facts, 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 facts. My contention is that our culture kind of hyper fixates on the facts, but we don't pay it as much attention to the theoretical, ideological, and paradigmatic assumptions and premises that drive the selection, organization, interpretation, implementation of those facts. 
We focus on the concrete facts, but are blind to the abstractions. And what I hear all the time from people is if only the other side had the right facts, they would agree with me. Right? You, the, the, the reason why people are crazy is because they have the wrong facts. If you have the facts that I have access to, you wouldn't be crazy. You wouldn't be stupid. You wouldn't be a liberal. You wouldn't be a conservative. You would be, you would agree with me completely. Right. And I think obviously this is kind of a, a mistaken notion because it doesn't look at the abstractions that do so much framing of the facts. So most people think that reasoning about things goes something like this. We, we wander out into the world as blank slates. Uh, we, we unbiasedly collect all of the accurate empirical facts and data about reality. We then use critical thinking, reasoning, and rationality, like making inferences, making inductive leaps from the facts to a conclusion. I think the U.S. should do this. I think we should have universal health care. I think uh, um, you know, we should uh, um, have more stringent immigration measures, et cetera. Uh, but what we're blind to is the framework of premises and presuppositions that encases how we collect facts and how we reason from them to conclusions. This is often where ideology comes into play, right? So there's this invisible framework that what Lakoff said that guides how we think about specific things. So we're going to pause on ideology and we're going to move a little bit towards exploring what meta is, and then we'll put them together. So there are different definitions of meta. Um, the one I'm working with is reflecting, relating, or analyzing from a higher level or perspective that transcends the boundaries of the object in question. So you're, you're looking at something from a place that's external to the thing itself. This could mean reflection on the nature of the subject itself or knowledge of its own category. So there's a kind of self-aware recurs recursivity going on with a meta-analysis. So example would be like meta science is science about science. And so instead of chemistry or biology being in a specific type of science, your meta science is looking at using the scientific method to improve the scientific method. Meta theory likewise is a theory about theories. What are theories? What are the nature of theories? How are theories generated? How do we know if theories are coherent? Not a specific theory like evolutionary theory, quantum field theory, Austrian economics, critical race theory, integral theory, et cetera, right? So meta is, is, is kind of a, coming at something from a higher level outside the immediate confines of being in the thing. So if we put it all together, we can say meta ideology is reflecting to, reflecting on, or analyzing ideologies, including our own and other ideologies that we don't hold, from a higher meta level vantage point or disposition outside the confines and parameters of a particular ideology or framework. So remember this little this diagram I showed last time? With the meta disposition, you're reflecting on the system of premises, the beliefs, the abstractions that in frame or encase one's thinking about politics, facts, what we should do as a society, et cetera. So we're not getting stuck or trapped within the confines of an ideological frame. We're reflecting on it from a higher level instead of always being in it. And this is this disposition is aimed at our own convictions and leanings, as well as what I call the landscape of ideological conflict writ large. So instead of taking just taking a side and attacking the other side from that same side, you can reflect on the landscape of conflict while still authentically holding whatever beliefs you do. Right. So your reflective reflection on the orienting abstractions, the abstractions that orient your way of viewing the world. So the primary locus of analysis in meta-ideological politics is on these systems of ideas, these paradigms, these ideologies, right? These, these abstractions. And we're going meta on these patterns of political thinking, of these concepts, these abstractions. And so we're not going hook, line, and sinker within a single framework without knowing it. We're reflecting on the different frameworks and landscape of frameworks from a meta vantage point instead of being blindly caught in one and looking at the world through that entire lens. So just to back up a little bit, here there are basically three goals of meta-ideological politics that I'm trying to kind of promote with this uh, community of, of uh, inquiry and collaboration. So the first is to promote a meta-disposition towards ideology and any ideological content. And in doing so, we can transcend or at least work towards transcending the toxic polarization that comes about through ideologies clashing at the same level instead of reflecting from a higher level, right? And we're going to look at this concept called decontestation in a bit. And so what we're looking at is we're, we're looking at um, these abstractions from a higher level, but we're still acknowledging that we might have, uh, uh, we might have biased convictions, right? I lean left, I lean right, you're a centrist. That's fine to acknowledge, but it's acknowledging that from a meta disposition uh, while you acknowledge that you authentically hold whatever value you do. The other idea with this meta disposition is to look at ideologies as tools instead of just as dogmas or identity defining 
political uh, affiliations, right? So they're analytic tools that we can reclaim and use to enrich our understanding of the complex world we live in, instead of reducing the complex world to a single set of abstractions per one ideology. And the second idea is to develop and experiment with new frameworks, theories, and analytic tools to improve politics. And these include sciences, or I call system sciences, that are not really a part of our conventional, our, our mainstream political discourse, right? So complexity science, game theory, network theory, information theory, evolutionary theory, et cetera. And the community that experiments with this can be called an enabling constraint. So an enabling constraint is a constraint that doesn't restrict, but enables new emergence. So an example of an enabling constraint is like your kneecap. The kneecap prevents your leg from bending forward. So that's a limitation. But in preventing your leg from bending forward, it enables other things. You can run, jump, walk, and move in ways you couldn't if you didn't have a kneecap. So the, so, so the community itself acts as an enabling constraint or catalyst to, to explore and experiment and spit out new ideas that we can try to make politics better. And the final one is to have a dialectic between theory and practice. So we're not getting stuck in an ivory tower, but we're coming up with ideas and then we're implementing them and testing them in the real world. And we do this in two ways. We talk to people on their own terms, on their own turf, and I'll get into this in a bit on what, what this has looked like for me. And we're striving to understand all ideologies and ideas on their own terms before just looking at it through our own lens. So let's look at what this last part means and how we can get stuck when we, when we look at other ideologies, especially ones that we do not like. So Frieden, again, right, most eminent scholar in ideology, he, he argues that a core function of ideology is what he calls decontestation. Decontestation, what is that? So Frieden says that ideologies act as the interpretive frameworks that decontest the meanings of essentially contested terms and concepts. Power, justice, rights, fairness, nowadays it comes like woke, et cetera. So essentially contested term in political philosophy means a term like justice or power or rights that are abstract and have no clear meaning. Their definitions and meanings are argued from, from people of different ideologies. So when you decontest a contested term, that basically means you double down on one meaning of something while rejecting the competing meanings and you close off the range of interpretations. That's what ideology does. Right. So when we have polarization from a perspective of ideology, it's a battle of decontested meanings of contested terms and ideas. So this often manifests in the culture wars as ideologically loaded language and framing battles where different sides lob decontested grenades from their entrenched cultural positions and attempt to semantically crush the opposition. What do we call, uh, um, you know, there was a last episode on um, San, Di San Diego Integral that was really excellent on um, some of the, the transgender uh, questions and gender, right? So that the, you can see the, the language in the culture war around this, right? Is it a gender affirming care or child genital mutilation? That's a decontested language battle. That's an ideological battle, right? What do we call illegal immigrants? Illegal immigrants, illegal aliens, undocumented immigrant, right? These language battles, these are battles of decontested meanings about things people don't agree on. So we take a term like justice or any abstract concept, what, what does justice mean? What the heck does justice mean, right? So the classical liberal says, justice means this, according to my ideology. Conservative says, no, justice means this, according to my ideology. Libertarian, no, it means this. Socialist, no, it means this. So everyone is decontesting the term uh, justice, which is this abstract, open to interpretation idea, per their own ideological lens. All right, so just to illuminate this one more, and I'm not a scientist, so I might butcher this analogy, but if anyone knows more about quantum mechanics than me, feel free to correct me uh, at the end of this. So the analogy with quantum mechanics is kind of like this idea of collapsing the wave function. Anyone here familiar with this idea of collapsing the wave function? So the meta disposition of meta ideological politics, sorry, it's getting really dark in my uh, house and I might, want to try, I might try to lighten a little bit, is akin to this notion of quantum superposition. So as I understand it, quantum superposition is where a particle exists as is kind of diffuse probability non-local wave. So it's not pinned down in a localized position. It's just open probability wave, right? So in this case, justice, an essentially contested term, exists in the universe as a kind of probability wave and superposition. In quantum mechanics, when you observe or um, try to measure this probability wave, you then collapse the wave function into a localized particularized particle that's measurable, but only when you try to observe or measure the wave. So if we use that analogy, when we think about uh, ideological decontestation, ideology is the lens, the framework, 
that looks at a concept like justice and then collapses the semantic wave function into a finite localized source of meaning for that ideology. So, so this word polysemic means a word that has multiple or many meanings. When you use ideology to look at a term, a contested term, a polysemic term becomes monosemic. You narrow off the, all the other meanings and you collapse onto one meaning. You double down on one perspective in regards to that thing. And so the idea is that we're trying to maintain a quantum superposition towards contested concepts a little bit longer before blindly decontesting and collapsing the wave function into our kind of narrow definition of what these things mean. That's the meta disposition kind of analogized for quantum mechanics. ChatGPT also said they like the analogy. So uh, for what it's worth, uh, AI kind of liked it. All right, so kind of wrapping up here. So some of the tools and methods that, that I've been experimenting and, and uh, playing around with that are kind of um, come out of a meta ideological dispositional framework. I'll go through each one really briefly. They're morphological mapping, transformative dialogue, ideological mediation, creative abduction, and ideological naturalization. So what the heck do all of these mean? Let's start with morphological mapping. So morphology is a study of forms. So if we apply the study of forms to ideology, we're looking at the study of conceptual and semantic forms, linguistic forms that have that convey meaning in a certain way. And, and this is also a Frieden term. I didn't come up with this idea. He Frieden pioneered the morphological analysis of ideologies. So morphological mapping means mapping out the morphologies of various ideology, ideological schools before rendering a decontested judgment. So before we make a decontested claim about an ideology, say that we don't like, we can map it out morphologically. So if we think about Marxism, socialism, what a, what's a morphology word cloud look like, right? Historic, historical materialism, false consciousness, exploitation, alienation, surplus extraction, all of this kind of Marxist jargon that constitutes Marxism. How about libertarianism slash Austrian economics, right? Spontaneous order, this is Hayek, right? Negative liberty, the business cycle in Austrian economics, methodological individualism, the non-aggression principle, right? This is kind of the morphological cloud of this uh, libertarian school. How about traditional conservatism? This is Edmund Burke here, the kind of founder of uh, modern traditional conservatism. Natural hierarchy, this coupling between the past and the future to ensure the preservation of traditions, uh, the ancient preservation of our ancient moral and spiritual traditions, natural law, right? Order and classes and natural distinctions. This is all concepts in uh, um, uh, traditional conservatism. So we're mapping out these constellations of different things to understand them on their own terms before we basically say, oh, this, this ideology sucks, or you're a racist, you're a fascist, whatever, right? We're, we're mapping it out on their own terms to get a kind of a clearer picture of what it entails. The second one is transformative dialogue. This is the one I workshop the most with the community, and it's a communication toolkit to shift how one relates to their view, not the substance of the view. So we're developing a more, I, this is the acronym SMAC, self-aware, metacognitive, abstract, and complex understanding and relationship to a view. So instead of trying to change someone's mind or convert them or persuade them, we ask questions, we share our own view in a way where the person can start to get a slightly more kind of complex meta disposition in regard to their own view without pressuring them to try to change their mind or, or convert them or anything like that. So it kind of channels people's energies to debate in a different way. So I found that to be uh, really fun to play with. Ideological mediation is something I've taught to different uh, mediation circles. And so, it, um, and the idea is that for ideological disputes, the conflict resolution toolkit needs to be a little different than conventional mediation. So these are some of the, the techniques that I've, I've talked about, right? Like with the one step back, you step back from the argument to explore people's presuppositions around what they believe, right? Done this a lot with race and vaccine mediations that I tried to mediate personalization, so getting beneath the abstractions into the personal, right? How did this impact you personally? What is your personal experience with this? The best possible disagreement is fun. I say, okay, it seems like you guys are not going to agree, and that's fine. What else, what other value can you get out of this conversation if you can't agree on the conclusion? And then the last one is micro agreements and symbolic actions. And these are little things you can do to demonstrate that you're, the conflict is moving forward in spite of an agreement. So maybe we don't agree on this and that's okay, I'm going to agree to read a book that you want me to read from uh, your side, and I'm going to have you talk to someone that you that I think you don't really understand from my side. That would be a micro agreement or a symbolic action. So yeah, again, these are entire courses and presentations. This is a brief run through. All right, this one is kind of the most diff difficult to understand, but I think people will get it. 
what what is all these like weird weird terms abduction acceptation okay so acceptation is repurposing something for novel uses in ways that differ from its original function so um acceptation is a term that actually comes out of evolutionary biology and the canonical example of acceptation is apparently when uh how did bir uh, dinosaurs evolve into birds it wasn't bird uh, dinosaurs throwing themselves off of cliffs, hoping they would sprout wings and feathers while in air, right? Apparently the wings and feathers evolved for mating purposes, it evolves for other purposes. And then later on, those feathers were repurposed for flying. So you're re so something is repurposed. So in a lot of crisis management literature, how do you repurpose existing resources to use in novel ways in times of crisis? So abduction, and this is from a great book called Critical Realism and Social Sciences, right, is to move from a conception of something to a different, possibly more developed or deeper conception of it. This happens through our placing, interpreting the original ideas about the phenomenon in the frame of a new set of ideas to be able to understand and interpret something in a different way. It is characterized by being unique and innovative. In the context of social science, it is a form of creative abduction when a researcher observes something from a frame of interpretation that nobody has used before, or which at least opposes conventional interpretations. So this is often done through uh, ide ideational acceptation, repurposing old ideas or frameworks to be used in new ways. It's a creative process. And I coined the term titanium man to describe this kind of like the steel man where you try to represent someone else's argument in, in its highest possible light before uh, attacking the argument. Titanium man makes you make the other person's argument stronger than it, they made it through abduction and acceptation. So highly recommend this, uh, this book here. All right, the last one is called ideological naturalization. And after we've exapted an idea and repurposed a framework, we need to see if it can be empirically scrutinizable. We need to have some kind of feedback mechanism to see if our ideas can actually be uh, trackable to see if they actually work. So you may have heard the phrase, your ideas are so bad, they're not even wrong, right? That's because people's ideas are um, not falsifiable. You can't disprove them or disconfirm them. And so there's no way of getting feedback. So a lot of ideologies can become problematic when they when people double down on these unfalsifiable ideas, right? I believe in original sin, you believe in a blank slate, F you, right? Okay, there's nothing, there's no way to empirically hash that out. So is there a way through abdu abdu abduction and acceptation to, to then kind of create, to naturalize ide ideologies in new ways so that we can get some feedback from them? So some examples of funny examples like game theoretic neoconservatism, right? Using the mathematics of game theory to try to understand the role of of uh, peace through strength or, or you know, deterrence at a global level, fractal nationalism, how do different uh, constellations of nationalisms, both at, at the state level and at more local levels kind of interplay, right? Path dependent power law, critical theory, right? So critical theory or like critical race theory lens, seeing how um, um, injustice or um, inequality compounds over time where the rich get richer and the poor gets poorer. That's kind of a, a, you know, um, a trope, but how do we mathematically understand that? Complex conservatism, right? Kind of a new reading of conservative theory of uh, a, a desire to preserve existing systems and structures uh, from really reckless radical change that could that could upend the, the wisdom that's accumulated. And then finally, uh, the organization I work for, QViolence Global, we use a public health approach to countering what we call the contagion of violence. And so this was a public health approach initially developed in virology and epidemiology was repurposed to stop social contagions like the spread of violence through a community. And so the founder, Gary Slutkin, um, started in virology, applied the model and experimented with it in, in um, gang, gang violence reduction and so forth, and did determine that it worked. And this organization was born. All right, so we're playing with different ideas, right? We can, we can relate to any ideas from a meta disposition. This is Marx, Burke, Hayek, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, critical race theory, uh, Peter Kropotkin, anarchist theorist, right? We're looking at uh, system sciences. We're looking at philosophy. We're looking at all these different sciences and disciplines we can play with and resource creatively at abducting them and accepting them to new, in new ways. Okay, really briefly, what MIP is not, all right? So it's not about surrendering core convictions, beliefs, or goals for passivity and action or neutrality. It's not about being a mediator. It's not about fence sitting. Okay, it's about holding and relating and understanding your own views and beliefs from this meta vantage point disposition. It's not about being centrist or meeting in the middle. And it's because it's not about the content so much of what someone believes, but how one relates to the belief. So I have friends who identify as far left and far right. And I have friends who are evangelical Christian. I have friends who are atheist. 
I would say all of them demonstrate a meta ideological approach in how they hold and relate to their views, not due to the content or substance of their view. So that's kind of the important thing I'm always trying to uh, convey with this idea. Few practical examples. So uh, we trained a team of what we call meta credible messengers to attend far right and far left events <clears throat> to meet people and build novel connections and to find leaders in different communities who we can work with to help depolarize and deescalate their own communities. Then what you do is you find leaders from different fields, you bring the leaders together at the table, have a little mediation. Then they go back to their community, say, I talked to the other side, those guys were okay. And then you can work something out. This is a, a medical freedom rally in Olympia that I attended earlier this year. This is, these are the Proud Boys right here. You see the yellow and black flag, Proud Boys. I hung out with them, talked to them, it was very interesting. Going to different environments and different places. So this is uh, the gun range in rural Oregon. Um, this is a PS90, if you haven't shot one, um, they're sublime. Uh, this is my uh, uh, friend and colleague who's a gunsmith who works with the far right. So we, we talked to the far right and um, people of far right extreme groups at the gun range is a great place or bars are another great place. So some of the places that we're hanging out, having these transformative conversations. <clears throat> this was a uh, church called Church Foundation Baptist in Vancouver, Washington. And they became notorious for saying, for preaching really, really vicious death threats towards like uh, LGBTQ and gay people. So I went with one of my colleagues. I actually infiltrated some of their services to see firsthand what it was like. It's pretty bad. Um, and so this was an event that was hosted by the far left. They brought Antifa and Black Bloc armed with AR-15s to the parking lot of the church during a Sunday service to have a gay wedding ceremony, right, outside of the church. Uh, and brought all of their kind of armed bodyguards. So we so we had a good talk with them about de-escalation and different protocols, establishing a perimeter, et cetera, making sure to minimize contact with the other side who was also armed. This was the Empathy Booth Project. So we would talk to random Americans about their thoughts on polarization, violence, civil war. We had cookies, coffee, Werther's for the road. We, would, we went to bars, universities, libraries. We set up this sign. This is my colleague, Cindy. And we just asked people questions that, catalyze deeper self-reflection and ideological awareness and critical thinking and uh, empathy for people they disagreed with. And we just paraphrased and listened to what they said. And then we um, invited everyone later to a community dialogue with different sides at the library and it went really well. So this is just a way of going to the community, picking out exemplars, bringing the exemplars together and then having them go back to their communities to implement some of these ideas on their own terms, on their own turf. I love leading trainings for the community, right? This Oprah meme. So other, a few other examples of projects I saw with crypto and DAO companies and startups on designing novel governance models and incentive structures that can be sustainable and also escape some of the game theoretic traps currently dominating the kind of crypto DAO field. Uh, consulting with different government officials and politicians and different policy initiatives, mostly in Oregon and Washington. Training journalists on how to tend to this, this a uh, broken information ecology we're in, right? How do we use some of these ideas to think about the nature of information and the degree of accuracy of different things you read in the news? My favorite and biggest surprise is working with evangelical churches in combating polarization. There, I've met many, many wonderful evangelical leaders and pastors who are really doing wonderful meta-ideological-esque work in their communities. Um, training activists on all sides on transformative dialogue and deep canvassing. So as people are advocating for their political positions in a partisan way, how can you advocate for your partisan beliefs in a way that creates less polarization, not more? Sorry, someone's at my door. Let me move to a different, different place. Instead of a Zoom bomber, this is a real life bomber. <clears throat> okay, I am safe my bedroom. All right. And then working with college students to bridge divides and have them start at kind of earlier age and um, working with uh, some of these skills and people they disagree with. So some things very briefly, I'm inspired to study further. So this concept of real abstraction from Marxism is also known as reification by Georgie Lukacs. Um, Austrian economics has a lot of interesting literature on how market mechanisms can lead to emergent properties of spontaneous order. So kind of a proto-complexity read of Austrian economics. Anarchism has some very interesting ideas on mutual aid networks. And if you can't rely on the government or the state to resolve conflicts via force, how can we embed conflict resolution practices in a community or in a society for the community to sustainably resolve their own conflicts? Different ideas of traditional conservatism, this idea of tacit knowledge that I've been very captivated by. It's knowledge that um, 
<clears throat> things that you know but can't say, and, and tradition acts as a kind of a bedrock or repository of tacit knowledge that's passed generation from generation that we don't even know we have from our traditions, right? Information theories like Boisot's work, uh, who is brilliant on um, how information tends to scale through society. Cybernetics has some interesting insights. Evolutionary game theory um, ha has some really good ideas on how different strategic, the tr strategic interplay around law and policy, right? Afro complexity and human systems from Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework. I'm a huge fan of very practical stuff. Legal epistemology is a field I've recently studied that's really interesting. And I define legal epistemology as how do we think about truth when justice is on the line, right? So in, in a, a criminal case, the, the epistemic criteria for a conviction of, uh, of, uh, of someone is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, what the heck does that mean? That's what legal epistemology looks, to, looks at. Philosophy of science, like Kuhn's work on paradigms, Quine's work on networks of beliefs, very interesting uh, epistemological insights that I think could be applied to politics. Construct, I'm, I'm going way out here. Constructor theory is a new theory in quantum mechanics. There's a woman named Chara Maletto who's brilliant, has some really interesting ideas of constructors. I'm trying to take that and apply it to politics. Uh, evolutionary biology on multi-level selection. So what are the selection dynamics culturally? That has a lot of uh, insight for some things in the culture wars. And then structural holes network theory. A structural hole is a hole between different networks that if you occupy, you have a competitive advantage because you have access to insights from all sides. So how do we occupy structural holes and bridge some of these balkanized gaps we're seeing come up in society these days? All right, I'm, I'm winding down here. So some adjacent work, my, my friend, Nate Kaufman, who started the MIP with me, um, he has these brilliant articles on resonance and game theory and started the plural, plural politics quiz. So you can take a quiz to get a sense of how expansive your political frame is. We were frustrated with like the one point political compass system. So he made a new, he actually coded a new test that has a more accurate re representation of someone's views, in my opinion. Samuel Ludford's work is really brilliant on information sciences and game theory. The Reconstitution Project, my friend Ari Allen started where it's a, it's a conversational, if you could rewrite the US Constitution, what would that be like in 2023 from a meta-ideological perspective? Ocean Jarrow's Library of Economic Possibility, he's an economist and also has an integral background. Brilliant, uh, he's a UBI advocate and is a brilliant economist and uh, uh, approaches it very meta-ideologically in my view. And my friend TJ's work on anti-memetics. Anti-memetics means an informational unit that for whatever reason does not scale or diffuse memetically. It has an anti-viral, anti-memetic quality. Uh, I think integral theory is anti-memetic by its very nature. So it, it, it's, a, it's a framework that explains why some ideas scale and why some ideas don't. I, that, okay, that was a ton of information. Thank you so much for sitting through that. Uh, I included a lot of information there because I have my, um, I, I have these slides I can send to a PDF if anyone wants it. You can email me at ryanakata at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat. We'll stop here for a few. I don't like question and answer. It's not, it's not like I have any of the answers. So I call it inquiry and response. Also a dialectical exchange of ideas. Yeah, I don't have any answers, but I'm happy to have an open conversation. And uh, let me stop sharing my screen and we'll have a few questions before we go into a breakout. Yeah, quick question, Ryan. Can we put your PDF in the comments on the meetup for everybody? The, the the PDF for my email. Yeah, there were a lot of links and stuff. We uh, people would like to like reference the books and the the, the sources you um, you mentioned. Absolutely, yeah, I'll send that. Okay. So Ryan, I thought I would get us started. Um, I really love the articulation and the languaging of all the nuances of what's going on. But what strikes me about this. Um, we could borrow from couples therapy that Gottman's work showed when a couple is in conflict, their body looks like it's in a war zone, they're breathing shallow, their heart rate up, think they can barely stay alive in that moment. And I noticed you're privileged in the upper left in order to go after that until I saw your cookie, cookie booth that goes right to the heart of the matter. You know, to somehow, when we challenge people's metaphysics, that need for certainty to take that down, you know, is really tough on people. So I think you've thought of that is how do we calm down all the physiology that's in an absolute panic mode? 
Yeah, that's such a wonderful question. I feel like I, I should defer to all of the um, therapists and psycho psychology experts uh, here. Um, the one thing I'll say really briefly, just to build on that question, Tom, is not only how do we do that, but who do we do that with and where do we do that to? And my question is, how do we get that? How do we create that space holding, trauma informed, et cetera, et cetera, um, space for people who normally would never access it or voluntarily seek it out? And so that was the idea with the empathy booth. And some of the conversations we had lasted two and a half hours while they stuffed their face with cookies and pounded down 100% Kona coffee. Um, and it, the, the, the visible change in their physiology, their, their breathing, right, um, was, was so visceral and palpable. It was just an amazing kind of experience. And then we said, do you want to leave your email and follow up with us and come to a community dialogue later on? And a lot of people did. Um, and, and people just feeling so angry, feeling canceled, feeling ostracized. And just to have a space, a two-hour space at a bar, at a library, outside of a Starbucks, to vent to someone who's going to give you coffee and cookies seems to have really made a powerful uh, uh, impact. And so I'm trying to get funding now to uh, train people in this and then scale this method uh, and use it all over the place, right? Gas stations, gun ranges, right? And just get it out there in that kind of way. And I think, Christine, your hand is up. Um, I may be exposing my ideology, but it seems that these concepts are valued more by people who are progressive. And I get that you're trying to, you know, level the playing field so that all people are heard and, and can participate. But is, has it been your experience that people who value this dialogue by having, you know, e exposing new ideas and trying to, you know, get out of the stuckness, that that is primarily propagated by people who are a little bit more progressive and conservatives are not out there trying to have dialogue. I hear this question all the time in the bridging and depolarization communities. So my answer is yes and no. So generally speaking, if you go to a group like Braver Angels, if you go to a group like Crossing Party Lines, it's very, it's the, the actual, Braver Angels is like the biggest national bipartisan dialogue group. The actual ratio of liberal to conservatives is 85 to 15 liberal, right? So very liberal dominated. Um, and there are all these different controversial theories that I won't mention for why that is. In my experience with MIP, it's about 50-50. And a lot of my best friends, Nate, my friend Nate Kaufman is, uh, is a Republican and conservative Catholic traditionalist. And he, he was the one um, who came up with a lot of these ideas. So um, my friend Rich Caffel too, who's a, a kind of integral leader, he, he does a lot of work in this. He's a lifelong Republican. Um, and my other friends who work in the crypto DAO space, who are very, very brilliant thinkers, a lot of them have very conservative kind of libertarian leanings. Um, so in my experience, it hasn't, the real, the kind of gap with the explicit um, self-sorting of people kind of who are collaborators in meta-ideological politics is not organized along left-right ideological lines, but more people who are more intellectual and, intellectual and philosophically oriented. Um, and that includes a lot of conservatives who are a lot of my friends who are conservatives, um, a lot of them are, you know, PhDs from Harvard. So I think that's kind of more reflective of it. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. All right, Karen, I see your hand is raised. Yes, I would love to hear more about the specifics. Could you flesh out for us the um, event you described where a church that was uh, uh, very hostile toward anything left and then there the a group held a, a gay marriage in the parking lot can you kind of talk us through that so that we we understand kind of kind of like, like like we were there watching and how it how what happened how it ended I'm, i'd love to hear more about that and and what you folks did there was no bloodshed thank god so there's this church that became kind of infamous in the area. I call it the, the Westboro Baptist Church of the Pacific Northwest. Um, the pastor went viral in, during the Club Q shooting in Colorado because he said, I'm, I'm so happy all these, you know, I'm not going to say the word, are shot and they should all be strung up. Anyway, this was part of the sermon. So I said, well, he lives an hour away from me. I'll go pay him a visit on a Sunday. So I drove down there, went to the service, talked to the pastor. He was actually kind of a nice guy, like to me personally, like, you know, aside from the, the rhetoric in the sermon. Um, talked to 
different congregants there. One guy was actually arrested by the FBI a few months ago for threatening a mass shooting against gay people in Washington state. Did it. And he actually invited me out to dinner. I almost went out to dinner with him, but I, my stomach wasn't feeling good. So I'm like, I have a stomachache now. I'm going to go home. Three days later, I'm in the FBI's office. They're like, yeah, he's uh, on bail. Um, so a few months later, other people caught wind of this church. And there's another uh, far left group that works a lot with Antifa and anarchists and Black Bloc. And they decided to go and have an agitation event at the, at the church where they brought all these individuals armed to the teeth with semi-automatic rifles to defend themselves from the far right who might counter protest. They had two um, uh, uh, gay wedding ceremonies performed on the, uh, in the parking lot of the church while they were having one of their Sunday services. And we contacted the organizer via, via Facebook and said, hey, we're concerned about escalation. What, you know, um, can we do something about it? So we, I showed up with my colleague at the event. We had some delicious vegan cookies and then talked to Antifa with guns. And we talked about the kind of plan. So they had sent two of their guys into the church to listen in on the service. If the pastor said, run outside and shoot the uh, activists outside, they would text us so we would be prepared. We had other guys kind of walking the perimeter to see if anyone was coming from different, different sides, either the north or the south including me. So we'd go on rotations. If there was, we would pause them and have a transformative dialogue empathy booth stall out session while we texted the guys back there and said, uh, there were some agitators coming on the way, so be prepared. All of it is done to min try to minimize contact between the groups that had guns. It's kind of like a nuclear warfare doctrine, right? You want to mutual, you want to mitigate the chances of mutually assured destruction by not letting it come down to anyone firing the first shot. So all so we had all of these like de-escalation buffer zones we created between us and the people that um, were at the church, and then debriefing the event afterwards. You want to affirm the norms of what went well. So hey guys, we we were all here today with guns. It could have gotten uh, crazy, but um, you guys did a great job de-escalating, not getting agitated, not responding with force. Uh, pizza party, vegan pizza party for everyone, right? Congratulations. So you want to you want to reinforce things that went well. And also they have, there's a vetting, they did tell us there was a vetting process that if someone was going to be problematic, they would not be allowed to join in the protest. So that was also comforting. Uh, actually, a lot of the Antifa and Black Buck are former military who are very experienced with firearms. Um, so there was, there was that too. Again, I, I, I personally, my opinion, I don't like that at all. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like going to someone else's turf with a bunch of guns, not for me, but I can't tell them what to do. It's legal in the state of Washington to open carry semi-automatic weapons. So they were following the law. We just wanted to make sure nothing bad happened, and thankfully nothing did. And I ran into the organizers at an event and gave me a big hug, and now we're uh, kind of friends and loose collaborators. So good, good, good relationships being built out of all of these things. Wow. So the story had a happy ending. There was no violence. But I'm not surprised that you have a sleep problem, Brian. <laughs> I, I, always, I always joke that I'm not the adventurous type, and I have very little... Uh, adrenaline junkie streak like I, I would I hate even flying on airplanes because I have anxiety about heights I save all of it for this kind of work so it's something I enjoy uh, Ryan to, to follow up on Karen's question I'm sure there's a lot more training we could have and experience you have to know which are the right which are workable questions but what are some examples of the like empathetic questions like I, I just I love this idea of creating the buffers, multiple buffer zones and catching people in conversations. Can I, can I email? So I have a cheat sheet of transformative questions that I've used, um, like maybe like 40 or something. I can email it to one of the organizers and you can email it to everyone here. So just a few examples. Um, the four categories I, I use are um, self-awareness, metacognition, abstraction, and complexity. So self-awareness questions, and I always start with self-awareness questions. How did this topic become meaningful to you? How, how did it become important to you, right? Um, what emotions come up for you around this? What's most frustrating to you about this issue, right? Questions like that. Metacognition questions are thinking about thinking. So instead of asking someone, what do you believe or what is fake news and what is real news? You ask them, how do you determine what is fake news and real news? Right? How do you make that distinction? How do you determine what's what's good or bad? If you have a policy that you want, what is the criteria that you use to assess whether it, the policy was successful or not? Right? Yeah, open-ended questions starting with uh, what and how. Um, abstraction questions are going up and down the ladder of abstraction. So I say, don't get lost in the clouds and don't don't get stuck in the weeds. 
So um, you can move up the ladder of abstraction and say, um, you can abstract a more general theme from something, right? Like what is the most important thing behind this idea, right? What's the core idea here? What's the core message here? You can go into the weeds and be like, what date was that on, right? What situation, what context are we talking about? You're deconstructed to a more granular level. And then the last one is complexity. So that's like taking other perspectives. What do you think it looks like from the other side? What are some things we have not considered? What are some other contexts that may inform this issue that the media or mainstream is not talking about, right? What are some other influences here? So you're, you're drawing more connections around the topic that kind of slowly changes people's neural associations with the topic. And there's a lot of, uh, I also sent some articles on <clears throat> research showing um, in, in uh, like trauma-informed approaches or how this is actually really powerful, having these iterative conversations. But I'll send you the cheat sheet of questions that I've developed. All right, maybe one more, uh, Jameson. Hey, Ryan, uh, thank you for your presentation. That was great. Uh, I know you asked a question earlier about how do you reach people? I don't know if that was rhetorical or not, but um, I was just curious from your introduction that the other person read, are you affiliated with the DHS? Uh, just briefly, because I have a question regarding are you, because you said something about you were part of the DHS or out, is this an outreach uh, related to a federal initiative? It's a, it's a federally funded grant. Okay. So I work for a, I'm a contractor in a nonprofit whose grant from DHS funds the program. I thought you said that. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Um, yeah, I uh, am involved. I, I do a lot of uh, outreach and wherever I can and, I know that there's a lot of change involved and someone mentioned something about a conservative or progressive type of perspective. Uh, and I know that uh, a lot of grant money is tied to other activities in the community. Uh, is there any way that promoting what your grant is trying to promote? Uh, I don't know if it's the word, but including that all the way down to the you know the grassroots level the community like for instance if i work for if i volunteer for the department of parks and recs or department of aging uh is there um or department of mental health uh is there a way i can reference you know the the resources that are being applied federally all the way down to like the City level and you know to add some legitimacy into this when you're talking to a someone who is maybe I don't know either intellectual or conservative whatever however you want to what demographic you want to place them in but uh just to get that conversation going uh, as far as that's a big problem because people don't it's like you know this uh, uh the other is a what is that that personal or digital personal in infrastructure type concept where there's just a lot of change going on that people need to be made aware of. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of coordinated effort, federally, state, or city level. Mm. There is on the business level, on the back end with blockchain and, you know, how governing my personal data and who has access to it from a marketing perspective, but me interfacing with my fellow citizen articulating that to them and the importance of being aware of certain things and your decks really you know touch on concepts that would help reach those topics right i know you're more about hate groups but i'm more about ignorance groups okay Can we uh, as... narrow this down because yeah, yeah. your, your comments are a wide swath because you sure. something out of it ryan to respond to Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank you. I, I got the, the, um, I think I got the kind of, um, thing you're getting general point you're getting at, and it is, it is challenging. And so one of the things I always talk about is that sometimes it's not, it's oftentimes I'll say 99% of the time, I don't feel like these ideas are, are, um, helpful to be mentioned explicitly, right? It's how do you create the conditions for a meta disposition to arise organically as an emergent property 
through the local and unique uh, kind of cultural conditions of a community. So one of the aspects of our projects, we have five CV or community-based organization grants where we're working with different local community partners, um, some churches, some uh, civic organizations and so forth, where they're applying some of these ideas, but on their own terms. So I won't mention meta ideology or any of these things to them, but we'll go through processes and practices that are replicable and iterative that enable a de facto emergence of such a disposition and way of engaging with other people without all of this uh, super jargony, decontestation, weird philosophical stuff that I put in this presentation. Uh, it's, yeah, right, because this kind of crowd, it's like a kind of treat for me to, to share directly. But 99% of the time when I apply the ideas, it's never directly, it's implicitly, not explicit. It helps, to, helps the mimetic diffusal of some of them. So not sure if that totally answers, but that's kind of the best... Uh, answer I could summon. So thank you so much. Just a little check. Um, we, I do. I did want to do a 20 minute breakout room. How are we doing on time in terms of questions and so forth? We're, we're fine. Do we do one more from Cass here? Sure. Ryan, yeah, just quickly, my, could you please speak my, a little slower? Sorry, yes. Thanks. Uh, my question is just, do you come out in communities to do this work? Yes, absolutely. And one of my favorite things working on a grant funded project is that I don't need to charge anyone for any of it, right? It's all paid for by the grant that I just bill as part of my billable hours. And so I always say, I really, you know, I understand that people need to um, make money somehow, but it, to me, it's always felt really awkward when people are like, hey, you're a mediator and, and conflict resolution practitioner and my community is fractured and hurting and polarized um can you come and help us yeah sure for a thousand dollars not right that just feels so bad to me so it's it's uh working with the community is actually my favorite uh favorite part of all of this work thank you yeah thank you and cash you did you saw ryan's email in the chat right so you can connect with him yeah i did mm -hmm. great I had a very quick question, Ryan, just to come back. This is Liz, um, regarding what you were saying about sort of not mentioning the constructs sort of in the weird people. I'm very interested in sort of how this would be taught. And my sense is from you, almost it's better to model it than to teach it. So is that kind of your, again, it's sort of context dependent upon who you're dealing with, I'm sure. Yeah, that's, a, I really like, I really like how you said that. I, yeah. 99% of the time, I think it's kind of a, it's a tacit transmission of the disposition rather than explicit articulation of the concepts, right? So that could be, an, so I think for me, the, the primary vehicle that I've used to channel some of these ideas tacitly is through the communication framework with the different people, right? And so my mantra is, uh, in an ideal world, I think that you'll have in, a, in the, the center circle, the smallest circle, are philosophical weirdo nerds like myself and some of my friends who are who can geek out at a presentation like this. Um, the second layer are people who um, may not necessarily have the most meta ideological disposition, but are really coming from good faith and listening to people and being good faith actors with people they disagree with. And the third layer, which is, I actually think is the most important, are people who are not even interested in depolarization. They actually are more partisan and ideological and want to um, spread their ideas. But to me, how you try to spread the ideas is more important than the substance of the idea you're trying to spread. So that's where working on working with activist groups and using different techniques, uh, this part of transformative dialogue part one is how do you ask questions that can stimulate these qualities that we want. But part two of the training is how do you share your own perspective in such a way that maximizes the chance that the other person will be open to it and might have a little bit more expansive understanding of it. And so um, I've trained more partisan activist groups in how to do this. And by the end of the training, the climate in the room is remarkably uh, not you know depolarized and a little bit more meta. Um, and so as they go door to door trying to trying to um, advocate for whatever policy or you know canvassing for whatever campaign they're a part of the quality of interaction they'll have with people and their doorstep will be different. So that's kind of, to me, the main way of transmitting this, not by lecturing everyone on how to be meta ideological, some crazy weird philosophical random idea that some weird guy came up with. 
Those I'm are, those interested are in that questions. work. I think that's so great. Yeah, I'm so interested in that kind of thing about uh, proliferating these ideas, but it's sort of a long game because it's sort of slow because you're teaching people how to like the context almost more than the specific content and, and ideologies or positions. Exactly. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The how, not the what, is to me is important. The how takes more time. But I think the real secret that I'm experimenting with is it's actually really fun for groups to be able to talk to each other, even if they all agree with each other, using these skills, because they create new insights, and that leads to an emergence of novel perspective, right? So even groups that are all agree and are pretty ideologically homogenous still benefit from some of these skills, and then that will ripple out into the greater community is my theory of change. Well, I'm sure I'm not a psychologist uh, or counselor or anything, but I'm sure a lot of the psychologists here would also to, uh, confirm that many of the conflicts that couples deal with even are the how, not the content. So the how is essential. When children say, it's not what you said, it's how you said, it couldn't be more true, right? Right, and we were um, at the last integral European conference. They did their magical mystery tour. Three days, 45 of us were together exploring all these sites and having these really deep, subtle experiences. And on the tour, uh, one of the women brought to her husband, who was a avid a Trump, Trump supporter. And, you know, nobody would take the bait, but he was doing all these events with us, including climbing into an eight foot wide singing bowl that they made ring with a log and they swung it out and they hit it. By the end of the uh, tour, he was so transformed going, this was remarkable. You know, just the subtle transmissions that happen without ever talking about the ideological content, you could feel him open up and ignite. So I'm always privileging being one of the shrink types I'm always privileging this state experience over the intellect until they're ready for it. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. Thank you, Tom. They'll see if DHS will now fund a singing bowl for my project, my takeaway. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of your dialogue and questions. I Now I would love to hear from all of you. Shall we set up the breakout? So I have a prompt that I would like to put in the chat. I don't know if um, this Zoom has been tracking chats from the main group into breakouts, but it goes something like this. So the ideas are how do we apply some of these ideas and get out of our bubbles? And um, what, in whatever way you wanna label it, groups, movements, organizations, right? Partisan groups, community groups, et cetera. Should we try to work with and how? Right. So, so what are what are the groups that you really feel drawn to working with or bringing these ideas to them on their own terms on their own turf? And we'll have uh, twenty minutes, five people per group, and if each group can have a note taker record the insights that you all talked about, and then each group will report back in the big group at the end, so everyone can hear from everyone else. If no one volunteers to be the note taker, whoever's birthday is next, I'm sorry, you're the note taker. Breakout sessions are not recorded. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Great to see all of you. Hope you had some stimulating and fruitful uh, discussions in your breakout groups. Um, let's see how we can do this. So room one, Carol, Christine, Marjorie, Mary, and Tamar, who was your note taker slash reporter? Um, I was the note taker, and we I, I would have to say we're all over the map. Um, uh, but um, uh, um, let's see. One of the things that came up was was the the need to help people recognize that there are two sides to a story. Um, uh, and then um, and then we talked about politics in terms of when the losing side um, loses. And and the 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 desire for that minority to rule in a way to in a way to help alleviate that backlash. So that was kind of a a theme that came up um, uh, around the political ideology and the the ramifications of that. Um, uh, talking about how to decrease the polarization, um, 
and change the hostility um, without hating one another, um, uh, without talking. And I think that thing about just talking rather than experiencing, um, uh, experiencing people, the need to see a human being. I think that's something, Ryan, that you certainly brought home of, you know, how you just kind of began to listen and be interested and curious. So trying to, not trying to convince people that your facts are right, um, but being interested um, and um, and getting out of the bubble. Um, uh, Christine talked about, um, you know, understanding that history repeats itself over and over. Um, and she was feeling somewhat more hopeful that we can get through challenges, even though they're really difficult challenges right now. Um, and um, Marjorie talked about taking cues from Marianne Williamson, um, uh, who is, um, you know, you don't give up and you keep working to to have alliances and um, uh, systems. Well, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure we actually um, focused really on what we were supposed yeah, no to. Problem. Um, um, but uh, uh, and then and then it went into um, the concerns about where we are now in that heightened polarization um, mm -hmm. between, you know, insurrection and examples in the past of we had a civil war, but this was a, a felt different, a felt sense and the thing about the fear body and it, the hatred beneath the hatred is actually this huge fear of, of la losing agency, losing power, losing a sense of your place um, uh, in, in the society. Um, uh, and so that, that we were, we were kind of talking and people having, having less agency in the sense of how they can even um, economically mm -hmm. earn and care, and and the it it seems to come out in hatred um, and aggression, but it's actually that fear of losing their sense of their value um, and their importance and their status in the society. Great, that was great. that was pretty much it. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Yeah, no problem having a, a twisting, winding discussion, as I'm sure a lot of people have had. So let's go to room two, Bart, Kathy, Lynn, Sandy, Shara, and Daniel, who is your note taker? And you don't have to repeat what everyone says, just capture some salient themes and nuggets that came up in your group. I was the note taker. So um, some of our themes, we talked a lot about bubble out of bubble, which I kind of are using group in group out group for lack of a better word, but um, kind of asking some of these questions, which we'd really like to get from you, Ryan, would be very helpful within homogenous groups because there's so many divergent viewpoints within our homogenous groups. So these questions will get us out of our bubble and among ourselves, which will prepare us for the bigger job of talking with others who might even have more divergent views ahead. And then we talked about how the questions can really show us how much differentiation really exists within our homogenous groups and being comfortable with that difference as a coherent organism actually allows us um, as, as, a, as an in-group to um, be more of a field of emergence while being more comfortable with the differences um, that will transmit when we talk with others. We talked about implicit understanding um, perhaps is understanding that we haven't crystallized, so it's more easily threatened. And in-group discussions can help us clarify what we really think and believe, which would be making it more explicit, so then we can be more present in a more conscious, less triggering a way with others. So when we have conversations with people we don't agree with, um, we can then even end up taking about things about them that we haven't thoughtfully considered, and that will allow us to be more of an open system for new information. So kind of a lot of good reasons to be doing this work, quote unquote, among ourselves, actually. And um, 
then we did kind of talk a little bit about like how to get less heady, how to make things more personal, how to um, create containers for greater understanding, the difficulty of uh, really being an active listener curiosity if it's only one-sided and when does that kind of become too draining. And then some people said we might want to have discernment that we might want to really be understood in our base relationships so that we can almost have the capacity to talk about those who won't reciprocate curiosity or, you know, maybe a, or won't reciprocate understanding or or something like that um, might be helpful. And then just one last point is, um, uh, you know, that we've had a lot of uh, maybe examples about how people with different views from ours have been uplifted by being in our communities. And um, I was part of a marriage mentoring um, uh, program as a client with my then husband, where my mentors had like a picture of Sarah Palin on their binders. And a lot of the events were in conservative churches and I actually was uplifted by some of the strengths that community had that wasn't my community that was uh, a, you know, very strong and even very healthy um, commitment to uh, uh, family values and, and, uh, uh, and, and yeah, those types of things. So those wow. were some of our uh, points. Great. Thank you so much. Beautifully, beautifully described and summarized. Okay. Thank you. One more. Let's see. Room four, Eric, Karen, Richard, and Keith. Okay. Hello, everyone. So yeah, a lot of good ideas. And I think just to, to be aware of the time, I'm sort of filtering as to, you know, what really struck me. And there was a, a comment made of, you know, like, how do we awaken our capacity for love and affection towards the other? And there was just something that really just hit me about that, that, you know, even to be aware that I'm not feeling that open or not feeling connected is an important start. And then I can say, hmm, wow, I'm, you know, in what ways might that be going to get in the way? And something that, you know, occurs to me too is like, how do I prime myself to go into the settings that I'm going into that, you know, what's sort of like the preliminary humility practice, if you will, when you're talking about, you know, George Lakoff, for instance, and you had this one view and it's like, well, I'm kind of doing the same thing. And it seems like we can maybe, you know, take on that set a little bit for ourselves. It's like, well, I really don't know. And in that having, you know, compassion for myself is potentially confused and, you know, and just really going in with an open curiosity that truly wants to know, you know, what's going on with another person that uh, seemed to be, uh, yeah, uh, the, the necessity of spaciousness that, you know, without filling with all the content that there's something about the space that allows new things to emerge and that that's important. So I think that would be part of what I would uh, highlight in there. And I think one other thing, Ryan, just to say that uh, we did appreciate uh, the examples, like when Karen prompted you for specific examples, and if there's a way to bring in more of that too, that's really helpful to hear those. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. That was very concise. We have a brief time for just the last group, Jameson, Liz, Phyllis, and Wheaton. Hi, this is Liz. I was a note taker. And I'll just do the same kind of thing. One of the main ideas that came out for us was um, this notion of um, getting out of our bubble and what groups we could bring it to. It really boils down to, um, similar to what Eric said, the awareness and and sort of almost focusing on our, on our own self so that we can bring it almost to every context because you never know when you're dealing with a context where you know something as diverse as pickleball it's very non-political and so you get a really wide range of of thinking there and it's a very uh it's a gentler context perhaps and so it's a great place to start having these kind of conversations and practicing the curiosity perhaps and the um the types of questions you're the empathetic questions you're talking about in a sort of an easier context to build you know practice with them 
Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. And, and uh, thank you so much, everyone. It was a huge pleasure to talk with all of you and hear from all of you. And uh, yeah, I will turn back to the organizers. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, we really appreciate that. that was, you know, so much to digest there. And uh, I, I know I'll be, I'll be looking at the recording, <laughs> trying to internalize a little bit of it. That was really great. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank everyone else for coming as well. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's see. Oh, and Ryan, I, I'll put uh, back in the chat here, you already posted it, but we'll put your email. So if anyone wants to contact Ryan, uh, I just put the email in the chat there and you can get more information. Um, remember that uh, the recording of this meeting will be up in a couple of days. And also remember that next month on December 9th, uh, we will have Dr. Matt Kreinheader on integral entrepreneurship. And uh, that should be great. So join us for that. Um, and uh, also remember to visit San Diego Integral.org uh, for any further information. It does help if you uh, sign up for one of the groups in RSVP so we have an idea who's coming. So uh, we're going to sign off, off for the official part of the meeting. So if anyone has to uh, drop off at this point in time, thank you for coming and uh, feel free to just. Uh, you know, hop, you can uh, pop off the meeting and then uh, we'll just uh, stay open for uh, just informal uh, social time for the next uh, half hour to 45 minutes. So again, thank you, Ryan. And uh, thanks to those who are dropping off. We'll see you next time. Okay, we've got a, a quick little uh, three minute video to play of uh, Ryan's integral rap. So I'll get that going here. Oh God, I did not. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to sign up for that? I mean, I mean, you could. It's uh, something that I I um, don't really identify with anymore. But as a kind of relic of my past self, sure. <laughs> and quick before you do that, oh, could I just wanted to confirm if you'll be staying on with us, Ryan, for a little while? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Can you hear that? Yeah, it's playing. It's a little soft. Can you make it louder? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in evolution, a new world solution of secular and sacred and east-west fusion to wake up and grow up and clean up delusion? AQAL is a system I'm using from the breath of the divine and all life that's in it. From the depths of the mind to the heights of spirit, through space and time, the sky's a limit. Integral philosophies, my guide to living, integrate perspectives. Whether it's inner or outer, single or collective, transformative changes occur at line streams and states, waves and stages ascend the spiral. From tribal survival to divine arrival, there's no time to lose, evolution moves. I'm just another hole on in a cosmic groove. From magic to mythic, from science to mystics, from Freud to Buddha to rational pluralistic. A map of the cosmos that's truly holistic. Transcend and include all things in existence. From systems to planets, from Gaia to God. Atoms to emptiness, truth and beyond, from sense and soul, one taste of divinity. Integral evolves from here to infinity. Integral theory covers all the bases, from consciousness to science to cultural spaces, from the inner subjective to the outer we, to the interobjective to the big three. Universe, soul, and relative, consciousness elevates, patterns of the cosmos connect and interrelate, spirit from bottom to top, you can't stop it, the force of eros and agape, not a pre-trans fallacy of magic and mystic, not a scientist who's grossly reductionistic, not a postmodernist who's radically pluralistic, or a tribalist who's mythic deterministic, but an integralist whose holistic view sees that everyone has a piece of the truth, evolution spark, transcend and include from the smallest quarks to the god in you from magic to mythic from science to mystics to freud to buddha rational pluralistic a map of the cosmos
that's truly holistic, transcend and include all things in existence, from systems to planets, from Gaia to God, atoms to emptiness, truth and beyond, from sense and soul, one taste of divinity, integral evolves from here to infinity, we've come a long way from our days of prehistory, evolution's purpose, contemplate the mystery, from Lao Tzu to Hegel, Eckhart and Aristotle, from beige to teal, grow subtle and causal, the map's not the territory, practice live it, relax on the path till you bask in spirit, take action, act till you ask what's in it, act with compassion, unmask your limits, the problems of this world seem more than we can manage, from social pain to economic collapses, from climate change and environmental damage, with an integral mind will you take on the challenge from tensions and nations to racist shit. Just face it, for it takes grace and grit. Have patience, wait, meditate, and sit. Evolution will rise, just awaken it. From magic to mythic, from science to mystics, from Freud to Buddha to rational pluralistic. A map of the cosmos that's truly holistic. Transcend and include all things in existence. From systems to planets, from Gaia to God, atoms to emptiness, truth and beyond. From sense and soul, one taste of divinity, integral evolves from here to infinity. <laughs> that was great. That was unbelievably good. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> Why don't you identify with it anymore? It's dynamite. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so embarrassed, but thank you. I, uh, <laughs> you can blame that on me, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I loved yeah. it. I, I thought this group would appreciate it. Well, yes. thank you. If, if you wanted to That's share another a rap, an integral rap video that I am proud of, you should watch the Ken Wilber versus Frank Visser rap battle. That is fun. In fact, maybe maybe one of us can find it and put it in the chat. That is edgier and it's a lot and it's even more fun. I'll find it. Oh, okay, the minute. rap is of a higher quality. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's like the epic inter, epic integral rap. Is that epic rap battle of integral? Okay. You know what? Play, play it here too. It's pretty short. Um, Marianne and Wheaton, are you new to integral? Yes. So just that rap transmission, what did you get out of it? I'd be curious as heck. Uh, it's, it's right on. I love it. I'm, I feel giddy. Yeah, it's pretty amazing watching people new to Integral that the scope of, you know, what it purports to map and understand is just something. So I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Awesome. Do you have anything, Wheaton? I'd love to hear you. Yeah, it touched, it touched a lot of points. Um, and what, uh, what I especially really uh, liked about it is that it had, it had humor. And, um, you know, Integral doesn't have enough humor sometimes. And that was just great. You know, it touched all the points and, and it was, uh, it, it, it hit the points, but it was also light and fun. Speaking of, is it, is it okay if I share the, rap battle please i, I put it please. in the link oh, oh, oh you want to play let's it now, play it now. It it's even right. better yeah. i found yeah, it ahead. on my uh youtube um i think i have to share sound right uh, and it's just one just based on the epic video. rap battles just for context epic rap battles are like these sort of comical like back and forth between <laughs> two perspectives oh it says my screen share is paused you can you can you share the yeah Visser one in the same way. Frank Visser also loved it. You know, he thought it was really funny. Good. Those of you who don't know, Frank Visser has been a critic of Wolver through the decades. Here we go. Epic rap battles of integral. Ken Wilbur. Versus Frank Visser. Begin. I'm the vicious Frank Visser, ain't no Wilbur ass kisser. I'm an actual, factual, rational ripper. Just retire, Ken. Your shit gotta stop. This is integral life. Or a new age crystal shop. Step back, Baldy. I'm the real scientist. 
guess not some pseudo-scientific shit on cosmic consciousness So hide in your loft with the navel gazing koan I'm about to rip you a new asshole on Your <laughs> foo-foo, Buddhist tantra yoga, your amber Your witness is Jehovah Now that I'm done thoroughly kicking your ass I'll put you back in your place Fifth grade science class <laughs> I'm the greatest mind mankind has ever seen Battling some chump who's not even a green Unscientific, well that's a weak diss Who told you you could fuck with the Einstein of consciousness? This is the Ken Show, permanent state of Ken Show Sitting in my zendo, watch my bicep flex flow More depth and span than you'll ever see The only book you ever wrote was about me You're jealous of my status, your heart and your rival I'm at illusions apex, you're at the bottom of the spiral Don't waste my time Frankie, you're five stages below me I did tell my students suck my dick, so blow me. Your supposed science is just magical voodoo. The best book you wrote was a brief history of woo woo. You formed a cult that was full of abusive gurus. Don't want to talk about all the scandals done, do you? There's an error in arrows and a gap in agape. It's a cold hearted universe and your crap can't rock it. You don't understand these complex physical forces. Your big three are all divorces. I'm the voice of reason. You're old and you're soft. Living all alone, jerking off in your loft. You're full of shit, Uber. Eros makes no sense to me. Your your time's up, disintegrate into entropy. Don't lecture me on entropy, a clueless clown The cosmos is winding up, but you're winding down I'm the greatest mind, pound for pound And I pound down Flatlanders' faces right into the ground I'm a mystic, your insistence on statistics Is a sickness, your reductionistic physics is materialistic I know that panpsychism is true Because a rock has more consciousness than you So take the spanking, Frankie You're not worth my payday I'm stopping you cold like I'm stopping my brainwave So fuck your second law, quartered in my quibrivium this rap battle has been far from equilibrium. Who won? Who's next? You decide. That was fun. I wish I had a little more content, though. They're the just more ad hominem attacks. You know, some of the real disagreement between these uh, meta thinkers. But, and boy, that's definitely version one of uh, Wilbur when he really would take down numbskulls. Uh, he, he's a lot more placid these days. That's the style of the epic rap battles. So this is sort of a play on epic rap, battle, rap battles of history. There was a, a, a YouTuber that made a whole bunch of funny interactions and had actors doing various characters of history. And so this is sort of, I think, a play on that. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Liz. It's really funny that you know about it. It's it's actually yeah. it spells oh, it's the same format. If you if you check out epic rap battles of history, it's like a millions and millions and billions of people watch. It's like um rap battles between like major historical figures. That's very witty and very clever, so highly recommended. And presidential candidates before the debates, um, you know, sparring on their different positions, and they're they're clever and and rhyming and and hilarious. Yeah, so this is a takeoff on that. So it's more it's more sparring than content often in those two. <laughs> I went back and I read some of uh, <clears throat> Wilbur's papers when he was in transpersonal psychology, and you could feel the frustration of the man. They were trying to hem them in to really quantifiable and operational definitions. But he was like, you don't know how much I have to write and how much I have to say. So it was pretty interesting seeing those early battles. Yeah, good to hear that Frank Visser thought it was funny. Glad to... that, that, that speaks well for Frank Visser. Did you see how young Jeff Saltzman was? I have no idea whether Jeff Saltzman or Ken Wilber saw it. I made you when, when uh, Ryan posted that, I made sure to pass it on to Rob Smith. And he thought it was hilarious. And I just left it up to him whether he passed it any further. So I have no idea whether they know about it. It's actually funny because Frank, um, I, I, I contacted Frank before I released it publicly and just said, are you okay 
with me posting this. I would have I would have reached out to Ken too, but I don't have contact with him. Yeah. And Frank watched it. He's like, this is so great. I'm going to post this on. So he posted it on his website and said, this summarizes the entire conflict in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fun. I'm glad he was a good sport about it. Yeah. Good for him. Oh. I have a quick housekeeping thing for you, Ryan, just before we go on. Um, I wanted to just ask because a couple of people had asked about the, the whole slide deck. And so the, the instruction for getting that is to contact you directly. Is it possible for us to, to post a, a PDF on our uh, meetup and or website with that? Or would you prefer if people just contact you directly? Oh, no, you can post it publicly. Absolutely. Okay, that was great. Yeah. We'll, we'll take care of that then. Thank you for that. Great. Yeah, thanks for asking. Can I can include um, the transformative dialogue questions and other things. I can I can make it a little bit more resourceful if you're going to post. That would be great. It. That would be really great. I think people would appreciate that. I would appreciate that. Okay. Awesome. We'll do. Hey Ryan. Yeah. I was just curious. I I really appreciate your uh, this opportunity that not a lot of uh, discussion groups out there like this and your deck kind of really. I don't know how to describe it to you, but do you uh, provide that information maybe in different medium, like in like short form videos, say for instance, using some real world examples and you know a scenario type base that you could have people available to them as reference or you know filtered into you know is almost similarly to marketing uh type content to encourage collaborative or transformative communication whatever you want to call it do you do that is that part of your grant yes thank you for asking the answer is yes uh i'm not that good at doing um unless it's like a rap battle <laughs> apparently <laughs> i'm not very good at, at um making things really concise and pithy, but I do actually have a few videos like that that are like two or three minutes and I'm trying to turn, I actually, it's, I by the grants, uh, I have to do um, 35 more of those videos by the end of the year for a deliverable. So I will be working more on that. I can post one in the chat now for reference. You do you have a YouTube channel or will that be, will that be on many platforms like TikTok, Instagram and, and all of them or? Is there a best way to find those? Because I I'd definitely be interested in sort of following those as they get released. Absolutely. Let me post the channel. So while you're posting it, this idea of making integral more accessible to people, because uh, I think it's really a good one. Some of you know I'm helping to organize the Intro Conference of North America, and that's one of our main guiding features is trying to bring people in without the steep curve of integral because it it looks like you know people look at it and go oh my god how am i gonna be relevant here so we're gonna go with the state experiences all the time so that once they have the feel they're gonna want to language it they're gonna want to know what was that and have the experience so we're learning slowly how to do it i remember when i started everything was intellectual and the learning curve was just tremendous so i do like that idea jensen is you know something more accessible to people that don't read this stuff day in and day out i'm certainly one of those people um what i know about is integral medicine and integral um uh um therapy um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, somatic experience. I mean, I'm, I'm more, so that was where the word integral, I don't know anything about integral except the, the, the ways of entering it through when I heard about integral psychiatry, like 20 years ago. And um, so that's really my orientation. I, this was new to me. Yeah, I think you used integrative, which is a very close synonym. Integrative medicine, yeah, yeah. integrative medicine. Uh, whereas integral spans, you know, all epistemologies. Okay. And it becomes much more organized. But you're definitely in the right direction. 
and it's funny when you're a clinician on the ground, no matter what, you eventually realize the complexity of what you're dealing with needs a map far more extensive than we're all trained in initially. Mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting, though, what's happening um, in the field of um, in the field of psychology and in the field of therapy. It, it, to me, right now, it's a very exciting time. Um, there are so many collective summits, international summits, um, around um, you know healing, um, and it, it's just been very exciting, um, you know, to see. I mean, like. What is it? Um, uh, psychedelic um, uh, assisted psychotherapy, whole new field that's going to to come into um, the mainstream um, uh, and it is coming into the mainstream. Um, and it's just a different quantum. I mean, a quantum is coming into you know, it, it, things that that were not in the language of therapy um, on the ground. Um, and and it's like a it's like a new world. This is uh, this is one of my passions too, as to how how we can help by by osmosis help integral seep out into the wider collective, and it's got to happen without the jargon. And I've been you know kind of living this like the the theory is like the beige, like we're re repeating the same spiral. The first six, six the first six levels of first tier are going to repeat like in a higher octave in the second and third tiers, but we'll be living them. It's like, I'm starting to imagine the theory, the integral theory and other adjacent theories as like the beige stage. stage, And but and then the next stage is we find our tribes. And I started getting excited about like, I really feel like Ryan and I are, are part of the same tribe. Um, we, we've been in a, in a number of groups together and it's like, we, we are allies, we are buddies, we have each other's backs. Uh, and 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 to me, San Diego Integral is is one of my triblets. So it's like these triblets, and we're each part of various triblets, and we're starting to form the larger tribe. And so I have this whole theory that I've been playing with, as by comparing what I know as a cultural historian about the consciousness and expressions of the six stages of first tier. What will they be like in the higher octave of second and third tier? And try to imagine ahead. And um, and we are going to go up. This is part of my crazy visionary side, not my disciplined academic side. We are going to go up so fast to get individually and collectively because every new stage comes online an order of magnitude sooner than the previous stage did. This is a pattern that goes all the way back to the Big Bang. Folks, we are gonna go up so fast. I mean, by living it, by being it, it's going to radiate out into the world. And this meeting in groups like this and being together with each other is just part of how it's happening. I'm just so thrilled with the ICON conference right. and what Tom and his team is, are doing with it. It's, it's, it's going to spread. You know, evolution happens just like shit happens. Evolution happens. <laughs> Intellectual nerds giving up their rhetoric. That's going to be disorienting. <laughs> what a challenge. Hmm. Yeah. Climb so, down off the pedestal. What a sacrifice. So part of that uh, you know, rapid evolution that you're talking about, Karen, I'm, you know, just thinking of our technological tools these days and how much we have available and to make use of those. And so Mary, I liked, you know, when you mentioned the summits, for instance, because I, I attend a lot of online summits, you know, tap into this and that, and I'm amazed. And so what I wonder, Ryan, is, where'd you go on my screen here? Is Ryan with us? He's still here. He's muted. Oh, hey. Okay, there you are. They move around on the on the window. Sorry, there you are, Ryan. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, how to see some of this stuff in action, you know, dialogues with different kind of leaders within organizations, you know, you're reaching out to these people who have, you know, some credibility within their particular organizations. And what would it be like to, uh, you know, have a set of those things or using those four categories of, you know, building the self-awareness and the metacognition and, and so forth as kind of like you know, demo clips, I mean, not to use or abuse anybody in any particular way, but just to have dialogues where that's kind of informing the background 
and we can see those and then we have something more concrete to model because I come away from this really excited about the possibilities and then you know there's this big gap between what I imagine and what my current skill set is and what's going to help me to expand my skill set to be able to deal with people who have you know very different views than my own and seeing examples of those things in action would be uh, something that would be uh, potentially really helpful I believe. Yeah, hey Ryan, do you ever do like um or like in your teachings or trainings do like role play? Like we have somebody play one, yeah. A and lot that seems like that would be very useful. So uh, all right, uh, Eric, you're gonna play. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, Eric, I let, yeah. let me know if there's a narrative or character archetype that you have difficulty talking to, I will play the role and you will interrogate me with transformative dialogue questions. We can Ooh. No. Ooh. <laughs> I'm aware of this being recorded. No, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, you know, in terms of anything real time. But I'm, I'm aware that in terms of, you know, the, the groups that are out there in the world, you know, as someone who's been in integral spaces for a while, I'm pretty comfortable with a lot of stuff. But I have my edges of places that I have a hard time going, and you know what it's like to start, you know, feeling into that. You know, for me to go into gun shows, like no big deal. I'm very easy with that to go into a QAnon thing or to go into a place where people are talking about violence, you know, insurrection. I mean, there's a guy or a appliance dealer down the street from me, not even a mile away. It was, you know, one of the people arrested for January 6th, for instance. And that's an example of a person where I feel a bit challenged. It's like, well, how would I have a conversation with them? Someone who's, you know, very deep in you know, particular ideologies that I'm not, you know, particularly I don't understand well and you know I don't have as much innate interest and I'm trying to relate to him as a human being to say like okay um, you know how do I recognize his humanity but where's you know where do I find the common ground I mean if I circumvent the political discussion then I think it's easier to just you know ask him about you know things in life and so forth but sooner or later it seems like it might come around and it just you know part of it i guess is getting the track time of learning how to do that effectively and sharpen my own uh, skills and capacity to be able to meet a wider uh you know a wider set of people in life yeah absolutely no eric i appreciate you sharing all of that and um share, sharing the challenges and difficulties and we all have you know, edges and boundaries and things we're not comfortable with. And when I lead workshops for the public for QPDX, I always say, we're not trying to tell you to, to do, to go to the rally with the, you know, Antifa and the Prop, which with the AR-15. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to get people to jump into that, but I think there's a few ways, there's a few things I usually teach, like in terms of practical skills. One thing we do is what I call curiosity loading, where before you have a difficult conversation with someone, especially when you know what kind of ideological frame they're coming from, um, I I have people write down as many questions as they can think of that are generated from a place of authentic curiosity and not from a gotcha place. So I have people reflect on that, take five minutes to write as many questions as you can. And I say, it's not just about the content of the question that you, how you phrase the question. It's about feeling the spirit internally of curiosity. What does it feel like to prime the pump of genuine curiosity and use the emotion of curiosity to overcome anger, defensiveness, frustration, and so forth? Then I have everyone review each question and say, does this question come from a place of genuine curiosity or is there a little bit of a gotcha vibe in there? If so, reframe the question or delete the question. And then now we can really rephrase each question to be really effective, right? So taking out any like why language or you language, right? And starting with what or how and really getting to the crux of the issue. Um, and then that acts as a kind of roadmap for yourself, both internally, you've cultivated the state of curiosity that you can then bring into the conversation that can be used as a tool to manage any difficult emotions that come up for you. And you've already cognitively primed yourself by having this list of questions in the back of your head. If you're having a Zoom call with them, you can just have the questions up on your computer as a cheat sheet, right? Um, and then and then be able to ask them. So what I'll, I'll attach on the slides is the abstract framework for how to think about designing your own questions that facilitate the emergence of qualities that are pro-social and beneficial for dialogue, and then specific examples of questions that try to you know, get these to, to come up. The, the last thing I'll say too, when, we're, when you're, we're talking about, and we talked about this before, Eric and I call it Karen, but um, 
there, there's something, there's a, a network theoretic paper. It's an agent-based model mathematical paper that has a really interesting premise that I found to be true in real life practice. And that's, if you go to an event, you know, you had mentioned gun show, it could be, you know, January 6th type of rally. It could be far left event, it could be whatever. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I have a whole strategy and I train people on how to do this on the field team. Do not ever underestimate the power of the wallflower. Okay, that was me when I was in high school, high school right? Like go to a party, uh, no one uh, uh, talks to me, no one listens to me. I'm, you're, I'm just kind of like by myself on the edges. The people on the edges are the key because the people on the edges usually are not as much of a hardliner and are less identified with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like messengers, right? They're kind of like Hermes characters. Pick off, not pick off is a bad metaphor. Go after the wallflowers and talk to them. Um, they're usually less intense. Do not try to go for the juggler and go for the leader of the group. They will be socially pressured to shut you down, right? Talk to the wallflowers. And then once you build some momentum talking to the wallflowers who are also easier to talk to, use them to build in roads inwards towards the group and then use them as messengers to connect with other groups because they're usually less identified with the group that they're there. They're a little skeptical. Hey, why are you here? I don't know. I'm trying to check me out. Why are you here? Okay, that's the person you want to be talking to. So the idea with the paper is that they, they modeled that you, um, you connect two groups that hate each other by picking off the wallflowers and having them talk first. Then they bring some of their friends from the edge and then they talk. And then you keep on doing that in the middle. You do not bring the two leaders of the two groups together first. Well, I love that. It yeah. reminds me of Kurt Levine's field theory. Do you, do you remember that one, Ryan? Uh, one of the ways you, you, you make a group cohesive is threat them, threaten them from the outside, whereas going on the periphery of the group, the people that are a little bit more fluid in their conceptualizations, they can really be transmitters. I love that. It's great stuff. Hey, Ryan, what do you think of... Um like setting ground rules or, or agreements or context before, like, I don't know how I do it with a, with people I don't know, but with people I do know, like I have, I have um, conversations with my brother all the time. Um, and we have an agreement, you know, like if we're going to, when we talk politics or religion, we're going to, we're not going to try and convince each other. We're, we're going to listen and, and see what, if we can find common ground. And if we can't, we're just going to let it go. Uh, just mm -hmm. you know, so things like that. I think it's a I think it's a great idea both for one on one conversations and for group conversations. One way that I've started there's a method called grounding virtues before ground rules, and so the conversation is let's not talk about the norms or rules that are enforceable first that we're going to agree to abide by. Let's talk about the virtues and qualities and values that we mm -hmm. want to have emerge in this conversation. I want to have trust. I want compassion, authenticity, humility, et cetera. Cool. Now that we have a list of the qualities that we want, what ground rules can we agree to that will enforce those qualities? Right. So it's a great, it's a great facilitation uh, practice. The other one you can think of too is, is um, you can also use a more concrete approach, which is when in your life have you experienced a positive dialogue across difference? What was that experience like? So you mine actual experiences and then say what norms can we agree to that can uphold that can create more experiences like that so that's another way of both in the groups and one want to facilitate kind of a ground rule uh you know parameter to work with brian i gave an this is mary i gave an example when we had our breakout group of a rally that was um you know it was an anti-trump rally <clears throat> and there were these you know it was the majority, it was in front of the county building in San Diego, but there was a, a group, you know, active group of protesters. But I did something because I'm an old, you know, I'm not kind of like an older woman, I'm non threatening, but I went up to them and, you know, they were, you know, and it was, they were loud, but I actually went up to them and I thanked them for being there because this was actually kind of democracy in action that, that they, they had, a, they had as much of a right to express. Um, there, you know, it was just too, you know, they were there, um, but it was interesting because they perked up and they wanted to talk. Um, and it wasn't as though they were necessarily trying to convince me, but it felt right. It felt right to me to go up and say, you know, you have a right to be here and thank you for being here. Um, because my 
my website is dissent is democracy. And so I was like, you're you're here just, you know, expressing your ideas like anyone else. And it wasn't about, you know, changing their mind or them changing mine. It was just they had a right to to be in the space. There's that value statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sharing. That's that's uh that's really cool that you did that. And there's one thing in there I actually want to acknowledge briefly, which is you, you had kind of said that being an older woman, it was, you're not threatening. <laughs> yes. That, there is, there is something to that. It's called the, uh, we call the impact of identity. So that's one of the, my arguments for diversity is that different identities will have a different impact. So if you're not the right person to talk to someone who is right. So some, a lot of the conservative guys I work with who work with the Proud Boys are black. Um, but they, they could not work with white supremacist groups because they're black. Um, we would need someone who's white, like a white male to work with them. Um, so it's, it's, that's kind of the importance of a group having different identities because you have a different impact on who you can talk to and that will determine who you can reach. Right. So thinking, thinking about that is a, is an important thing too. Sometimes it's not your fault that you can't connect with people basically, you know, but if you're not I'm, the one to connect, you think who you can, you connect with, who could connect with them. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Chara. No, no, no. I, you were talking about like who, who you can reach. And, you know, maybe even from a spiral dynamics model, like the geometry, okay, and, and this could even be my internal bias, I could be telling on myself, there's a little bit of a geometry of my reaching down. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Like there's a little bit of a geometry of how can I help elevate these people who don't quite um, get it? How do we, in deepest humility, like approach these relationships where there's a value of being uplifted as well by the other side and not just reaching, but being reached as well. I don't, and I don't even know if I'm, am I making sense, Ryan? Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. I th I think so. Can you can you say a little bit more about for you what it feels the the reaching down thing? I'm I'm kind of um. Well, even if we look from a spiral dynamics and let's say we fancy ourselves at yellow and we see that the groups that we're talking to are at red, blue, and orange, and we are having a conversation because um, maybe there's a sense, or maybe I might have a sense that I know more or I'm more evolved. Um, maybe there's reason to think I am. And, uh, you know, this work is my service to help depolarize things by being a force of understanding. There's something unidirectional or one-sided or, I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, culturally um, elitist perhaps embedded in the gesture. And I'm wondering how that could be dynamically um, expanded. Yeah, yeah. I, think... Oh, sorry, was someone else? Go ahead, go ahead. Ryan. Oh, no, go ahead. No, please, and then I'll follow. I'll follow. I just, she made me think of something very interesting, yeah. Sure, yeah, I, I think, um... So, so just just to kind of be transparent, and, and maybe I, I actually have a slide on this, and maybe I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, I kind of disidentified from the integral paradigm because um, I, I didn't like that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think a few things have changed for me. One is my judgments towards people because we, we can't, you know, we, we're not going to get away from tribalism. We're not going to get away from being a little judgmental or a little unfair. I think that mine has shifted towards the person's character more than their developmental or cognitive complexity. So for example, when it comes to a lot of the evangelical conservative ministers that I work with, they're wonderful, wonderful, beautiful human beings, mm -hmm. like deeply good, virtuous, kind, sincere, authentic, whatever. Do they, um, do a lot of them, you know, believe in a literal whatever? Sure. Um, but it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really matter. So I'm approaching this. I have a lot to learn from them and there's a lot they can teach me. And I'm really looking for people who are leaders and exemplars in their community who are on board with dialogue, de-escalation, depolarization work, who can be, you know, um, uh, uh, lighthouses in their community around that kind of stuff. Um, so I do have that intention um, when I'm when I'm going out and meeting people. 
Um, and I think the third one, though, is actually on the more philosophical intellectual level, my own depolarization journey and kind of my move from mean green meme to use another language to the meta ideological perspective, right? I was a hardcore um, Bernie Sanders fanatic in 2015 and basically hated anyone who didn't support Bernie Sanders. Trump won. And um, I, if I, so there's actually a study on this too. If I go went and talked to a bunch of conservatives or Trump people at that time, it would have probably backfired. I would have become more polarized and more angry. So what I did was I basically checked out of politics for like three years and just read political philosophy. And that included re reading a lot of conservative philosophy and traditionalist philosophy, which was super high intellectual quality. People like Michael Oakeshott, people like Edmund Burke, people like Ross Hoffman and Richard Weaver. And I, I totally reconfigured my associational framework towards conservative ideas by studying the most intelligent, intellectually sophisticated thought leaders. So when I talk to people of different back, I've done that for every ideological school, right? Anarchism, you know, socialism, Marxism, fascism, even. I can list all the fascist intellectuals that I've kind of titanium in. So when I talk to these people, I just activate that pattern. And then that's that's kind of how I connect. Now I know that's not that's not how a lot of you know other people might might work. It's more heart-centered, but for me, that was my own technique that I used to kind of get to where I am today. So I don't know if that that answers what you're saying, mm -hmm. Charo. No, it's yeah. helpful. So fun. I'm curious what Marianne, are you resonating with this? I'm kind of curious what's Abs emerging for you. Absolutely. Yeah. The way that you described, um, is it Shara or Shara? Shara. 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 Okay. I want to make sure I say your name correctly. Um, I, I can, so it can feel very much like a reaching down. And I think that has a lot to do with um, when you're, when you're coming from your higher self, and especially if you're your higher self is speaking or there's kind of like the sense of difference in vibration. Um, and it, it can feel that way. And so what, what I often do um, is the place that we can meet, right? So when we talk about meeting in the middle is um, tapping into the heart you could actually just do the thymus thump. And because the question is, when you're coming from, oh, the way that a lot of people describe it, and I talked to some people that have had these experience and they say, well, I'm coming from a, a point of gnosis, which and so I say, it's like the difference between the Buddha and the Bodhisattva, right? So how does the Bodhisattva, how does the, how does that person talk to people? And so you can in space and can, how do I move down somewhat from the intellectual realm and just tap in when we look at, when we look at people in the eye, like, truly recognize, oh, this is just another version of me, right? And then suddenly we are, we're, we've dropped in the heart space and it just feels different. And it may not feel Marianne, you're really breaking I'm not up. I'm verbalizing what it is that I'm feeling. Okay, I'll stop there, but well, I don't actually, know you if, can go ahead. That, if that. Yeah, just turn off your video and then the audio will come through. Yeah. Just for a moment. Okay, I'm not sure. So I'm not. I'm not lower. sure. Yeah, we is we that lost. better? Can you hear me better? Yes. No, we lost about the last minute or so. So if you could, oh, you, maybe you could kind just, of repeat the gist or something. Maybe. <laughs> um, just the idea of um, the the place that we can all meet in common basically is is at the heart space, right? So if you um, if if we find ourselves saying, well, especially if we're using, you know, terminology and things like that, where is where do we find that the zone that we all share? It's going to be down in the heart space. I'm just getting a that sense of feeling that sense of um, stepping down from the from the higher self in order to be able to reach more people. Yeah. 
And if I could just you know summarize, I think what I hear you saying, Marianne, is the importance that we're doing our work on a cognitive, emotional, and embodied level, because it's only with that integration can we maybe sincerely approach others with expansive humility. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. That's a very beautiful way of of, of, of feeling. Expansive humility. I'm... Holy crap! I can barely do humility. Yeah. Respect. Real humility is always expansive. Otherwise, yeah. it's otherwise you're humiliating yourself, or something else is going on. I think. But admitting that in front of everyone on the recording, Tom, is a beautiful example of expansive humility. Thanks, Shara. That was really good. I, I really appreciate that you restated that. That was really helpful for, and Marianne, what you were saying. Thanks. And, you know, even when we're talking about, like, why integral isn't mimetic, that could be a key of that as well. Like, how do we integrate um, uh, our intellectual uh, uh maps with a uh, heart body womb tr pre pre tr pre um pre rational knowing as a as a really integrated embodied whole there's something that i think would easily resonate with many more people in many different places in their lives once that becomes more of the center of gravity of our community and culture Aaron, just jump in. It's a discussion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, just yeah. listening to uh, uh, what uh, Ryan was talking about, about uh, taking kind of like the omnis omniistic view where you're trying to absorb all people's points of views. And I'm not really sure, uh, other than addressing extremism, which I'm opposed to and the polarization that's happening out there in the world when I go to the park or I go on a discussion group, uh, for instance, um, I like this one, is uh, whether they're framing it in like a spiritual, uh, touching it from the heart or discussing it from uh, an intellectual perspective. Uh, I really appreciate the framework type approach that this group seems to be promoting where there really isn't one that I'm aware of. I mean, I can relate to a bunch of people who will talk about their inner chakra and stuff and how to get that aligned and just correlating that with somebody who's a you know has a different mindset it's either in it's hard to describe but it's like a, a very partisan a, it's very partisan out there and just addressing that it seems indifferent to people so yeah having a discussion a method to just bring a transformative conversation using very concise words when uh, something, a topic is brought up to bring it back to a rational dialogue is helpful. So that's what I'm kind of looking for with the group. And I, Ryan, your, your deck seems very helpful. I can read it over some more and circulate it. Thank I really you. have a question. I was just uh, just sharing with you that that seems to be the way you, it's about talking to people. I don't know how you're going to achieve that with your grant, but. Yeah. Uh, is it really necessarily about getting rational? I mean, it seems like there's more nuance to uh, understanding others than just getting to a rational place. Yeah, I think so. If I, I, I'm finding this this conversation with Shara and Marianne and and so on is really engages me where I live because uh, some as many of you know, uh, this has been a huge controversy in the integral world for uh, uh, two and a half years. Um, uh, there are some people who are want to throw out all stages everywhere because they're abused so badly. We don't want to think of stages at all, and. Uh, and I, I and I, I I've engaged in this because this is this hits me where I live for a number of reasons, and I, but I also know what integral has meant for me. I've been reading Ken Wilber for forty years, and um, share a little bit of my keep this short. Um, I I help my I, I help create and run an organization for my guru, and he he told he basically said if you want to talk about theory, talk to her. So of course people came to me. 
with um, whatever, their life crisis, whatever. And I was dealing with an international group where we had people, and I'm going to use integral jargon here because this is the group we were, I was dealing with people who were all the way from magenta purple all the way into second tier. And so in the um, early stages, because I was reading Ken Wilber side by side with being totally absorbed in my spiritual path, I was able to use this as a, as, as like a GP, as like a global coordinate system and a GPS. So I could get very early on in the conversation. I could get a sense of how this person saw the world. And I could, it just helped me get, get in sync with them and have the kind of open conversation with them and speak to, speak with them in a way that would reach them. And uh, so as to the issue, the, the issue that Shara brings up, which is just pervasive in this, is the reaching down. Like, how do we get ourselves out of the mindset where uh, now that we know that we're at this level and there's that level, now I'm, I'm reaching down. And, and for me, the answer is spiritual. It's like to, re to have at least an understanding, if not an experience, that we are all co-equal in God's creation, to put it in Western terms, to try to keep coming from that space so that it's a reaching across, not a reaching up or a reaching down. And with that under my belt, I could use the state, states and stages of spiral dynamics and, um, and integral to just kind of get an immediate, this is like using GPS instead of a paper map, right? That, that's what it did for me. And so um, I'm, I'm still, I mean, this is still a work in progress for me too, but Shara, I just want to know that, that issue of, of reaching down versus reaching across. And I just want to wrap up here. This is kind of rambling and this is my, my personal experience, life experience that I totally agree with Ryan. And Ryan and I have had this conversation a number of times of people at Amber Blue, the, the traditionalists, some of these are some of the nicest, kindest, best, most decent people on the face of the earth. They're not the ones out rioting. Um, but, and, but these are the people you, we want in our communities. If we have kids, these are the people we want their kids in school with our kids. Um, every level has its beauties and glories and essential contributions. And that's part of that. Um, viscerally getting that is part of the, that helps kind of reach the place where we're reaching, whoever we're dealing with, we're reaching, we're reaching across, not up or down. Uh, but for me, the foundation of that has to be spiritual. And I'm still working on it, still a work in progress. But but Shara and Marianne, I would just want you to know that basically uh, this is an issue that that hits me where I live. Oh, and gentle I, it's purple. important. Gentle purple is definitely going to chance challenge my uh, expansive humility. Yeah. I, I had some sweet interactions. There was a group of, of, of La I think it was Laotian immigrants, not Vietnamese. They had been, this, this was a few decades ago. They, a whole village had been brought over to the United States because they had helped the U.S. troops during the Vietnamese war. And they'd been actually evacuated and allowed to move to the U.S. And they came into my guru's organization as a group. And I'm the one, if you've got questions about theory, talk to her. So I'm facing this group of people who are asking me questions about magic. And how do you deal with magic? It's like, it, okay, you know, I am not going to talk to them in rational, in terms of, of logic and reason, you know, and they were beautiful people. So that was my experience with purple. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Liz. Oh, thanks. Um, I was just going to say uh, to Jameson's, point I really I'm delighted that you're excited about the deck I'm very excited about the deck too and I'm excited to post that and I really appreciate um your nerding out with us Ryan and um the the I think it was like really sort of intensive language and I can't wait to go through and uh revisit some of it I was also in the background working with the scribbler <laughs> talking back and forth at the beginning so uh yeah, <laughs> the getting that solved. So I missed part of it at the beginning. So um, yeah, I'm super excited about that. Oh, thanks. Thanks for doing the behind the scenes, uh, uh, dirty work, Liz. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to, to mention something really quick, quickly in response to what you had shed, said, Karen, and uh, what Shara had said. And just for me personally, my, uh, shall we say, disidentification with integral theory. And what I mean by that, it, it never came from a conscious it, it, it wasn't so much like, oh, I'm critical of it, like Frank Visser. Now, like, I'm going to reject it from my, you know, operating system. It was more like as I 
kind of got older and went into the community, there were too many people in groups who just could not fit into any category. Mm -hmm. um, so the abstractions of stages, it, it kind of like just melted away. So one example is one of the um, conservative evangelical groups I'm working with, I call them conservative evangelical, but they're really not. Their theology is what would be considered in integral terms, amber or blue, um, like mythic or, or literally believe in like heaven and hell and resurrection, that kind of thing. Uh, they're also um, very progressive on racial justice issues. And we're very supportive of like Black Lives Matter in 2020 and have a lot of conversations in their communities about LGBTQ issues, about racial justice issues. And um, after a certain point, I'm like, it's all so scrambled together. Um, you know, I, I talked to a QAnon, a guy who's a leader of QAnon, who was a Bernie Sanders supporter and um, has a background with Noam Chomsky and Marx. Wow. Like at a certain point, I'm just like, it's so scrambled up. And, and that's where I realized I don't really think that my orienting categories are going to be stages because it can't capture the nuances and complexities, but understanding ideologies and the con the kind of confluence of different ideological positions and how they cluster and decluster became more salient. And then I kind of pivoted to this framework that I presented with, but I, I just have had so many experiences with people of all sides where, and especially now with the changing ideological landscape, right? Uh, I have uh, what is left and what is right anymore, right? I have no idea, right? Um, so that, that's been my experience and kind of deconstructing my own preconceptions of how I thought people would be based on what Spiral Dynamics told me was not actually the experience I had when I threw myself into those communities. And this, we're talking Black Panthers to evangelical Christians to far right groups. It just didn't, it did not match. Like why, why do so many far, I mean, I know why, but like so many far right groups now are totally pro Palestine and pro Hamas. I'm like, what, what, you know, what, what am I, what am I seeing here? And there was in 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 uh, Dearborn, Michigan, an, an incident where um, a lot of the conservative far right groups are that were formerly very anti Islam are now teaming up with the local Muslim community to protest LGBTQ stuff in schools, oh. and so all of these other kind of conventional lines are getting organized and reorganized, and it's just a mess. And I could no longer box it in the way that I cleanly want, I once could, you know, cleanly box it. So this is the mess that I'm in. <laughs> yeah, my sense, Brian, is that, that it's like, it's not so much that we move away from integral theory as that we metabolize it. And it's no longer this abstract skeleton, but it's like, and kind of, kind of, it works well, like somebody used the example, you used the example of a kneecap. Um, it's something that we can attach the muscles and the viscera. It's something we live from. We don't even see it. We don't even think about it. But it's it's helping us move and act in 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 the real world. It's like it's we're we're, we're fleshing it out in our lives. We don't need to refer to this abstract theory so much. But it's like enabled us to move forward. That that's that's my sense of it. Karen. Yes. Uh... Regarding like the spiritual aspect of it, and I guess this might address Ryan's concern a little bit, because what I've noticed, it's like with uh, Trump and the phenomena grouping that I would use to describe it would be uh, like the patriotism, you know, cleaning out the swamp type thing where you've, you've reached a point and then you adopt an attitude and then you're with that group. That's uh that's one type of like a patriotic idealization and a grouping of individuals who don't appear the same but underlying they actually have the same motivation it just it appears differently um i don't know i i see it at reverse uh with the other phenomena but yeah, just the way people interpret things phenomenolog phenomenologically uh, seems to place them in a group until you talk to them. So like extreme patriotism, it's, I don't know if that helps, but I noticed that. And spirituality, like people who adopt the spiritual perspective on something. Mm -hmm. Like uh, they seem to group around ideas that are, they stick to what you can't move them from. So 
I don't know, identity, ide ideology, Ident identity. identity and ideology when we identify ourselves with a specific ideology. And this is gets, I, I'm in the upper left, you know, I, I'm yeah. kind of hey, Karen, into, into the psychology of it when we identify our sense of self with an ideology, if that ID identity becomes kind of contracted and rig rigid, it's very hard to let go of it. It's very, very hard. And that's why we need people like Ryan who can go in openly and find find a way to reach them and and speak with them in a way that they're willing to speak and yeah, start we're, we're, kind of like, you know, Ryan, I'm going to take your 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 talk about how you um, talk to the wallflowers. You talk to the people who are on the outskirts. I'm going to use as a metaphor for a personality structure and a personal identity is reaching somebody through the kind of the, the the wallflower parts of their personal identity where oh. they're a little more open not trying to go straight for their core convictions and and listen and then all listen and really and this is you know part of what ryan was saying really being there in a non-judgmental way so that they are willing so this is something I'm bringing. I'm just kind of scrambling. It's late. Yeah, I think we're all tired. Yeah, we're, it's late. Yes. So let's let a couple of let's invite a couple of people that haven't spoken yet. Sure. We haven't said much in the last five minutes. So what anybody... resonated with me is the wallflower within. We all have <laughs> internal wallflower, and if we can talk to that wallflower within with respect, mm. I think respect is something that is forgotten when we get into these kinds of discussions. The, the, uh, that is to say, when somebody is rigidly frozen in their own paradigm, that um, they lose, they just have no respect and they don't want to hear from the other person because the other person is wrong, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we need We need more respect. And I think the wallflower is a lonely person that has not experienced respect and i think that that would be very soothing for them and you know soften the rigidity within also yeah. absolutely Nobody. it's mutually beneficial mm -hmm. yeah. jerry or jameson or marjorie or danny Well, I'll just speak up for him on behalf of wallflowers. <laughs> I, I, um, I, maybe wallflower, wallflowers are um, there because that's who they are and not because they, uh, there's something wrong with them or that they should be a certain way or whatever. I'm just sort of half, half teasing here, but that was what, what I was thinking. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times the wallflowers in my context are people who are also new to the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't feel that they fit in. They don't quite fit yet. Or they're, or they're dipping their toes in, right? Yeah. Or maybe they're witnesses or maybe they're observers or um, whatever. Or right. they're introverts who are more comfortable just not being in the thick of things. Yeah. Or like I'm a... I'm a lifelong wallflower, and I think it's the Enneagram Five. You know, it's the observer, yes. analyzer, <laughs> and and I and I'm slow, so you know, I have to I, I have the perfect response, but I I will have it in two weeks. You know, so. I to process, oh, so. I've been there. <laughs> also, there could also be undercover FBI. <laughs> it happened. There. Uh, when you're, you, you can't, you, you're never going to meet in the middle with that until you get to that, that meaning of the word. Right. Because it's, it's similar to introvert, extrovert uh, polarity there. They're, they both have value. They're just different. They're, they're the opposite of each other. They're, they're mirrors of each other.
And it's fun, honestly, to, well, dissect, to disable them from there. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you so much. And by the way, yeah. thank you, Jerry, for hosting. Thank you, Eloy, for organizing. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. Thank uh, you, Paul, and I've got to leave. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, um, it's 7 o'clock, so we've been gone for an hour here after the meeting, so I think it is time we wrap it up. Uh, and uh, thanks so much, Ryan. It was just a wonderful presentation, and uh, you're, it's, you know, there's this part of it where it's a wonderful presentation, love the deck, but, you know, just love your heart more, you know, like the, you, you just bring so much to the, to the, uh, so much, uh, uh, a view to the this that's very just i mean to me just really unique and beautiful and i love love it. one of the great things for me about this group is it gives me hope for the world you know like i i see this beautiful work being done and it's uh it's, it's just a a beautiful thing it gives me a lot of uh a lot of hope so um and all of you joining us for that is another great thing for me so let's uh wrap it up tonight and uh, we'll see you hopefully see you all next month It'll be Thanks a good again, one, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much, everybody, for Thank being here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. It was a Bye. again, Ryan. Yeah. Thank right. you, Thank Ryan. You. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Winding down. For further information, including upcoming events, resources, links to our Facebook and Meetup pages, and our fabulous donate button, please visit our website at sandiegointegral.org. Donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue to provide information and connection within the integral community.